particular with Rhett Lashley's system that I feel somewhat favorable, it's not a complicated system. I think you already heard, too, Will Mallory say that's like, hey, listen, formations, once you learn the formations, it's it's good to go. And it's about, you know, a quarter of the amount of formations that we had the year before. Enos had a very complex system uh, predicated on a lot of motions and shifts. The shifts kind of dissipated as the weeks went on. But in, in, in this case, with a spread up-tempo I think it's tailor made, Paul. I really do for this. I, I almost think like it's going to be like a duck on the water. You know, okay. it's just they're just going to slide into this and and come week one, whenever week one is. Uh, I just think they're going to operate it with such efficacy. You're almost gonna you're almost gonna say, "Hey, man, it seems like these kids have been running this system their whole life," and that's my personal belief. Absolutely, and I think ultimately, you know what what I'm really interested in is the strength and conditioning part of this team. Cause obviously you can't get it done when you're not working out under coach Feely's um, strength and conditioning program at home. It's just not possible. You're not going to be around weights at all. Also, I think the teams that are going to be most affected is Michigan state and Florida state. Those are co uh, programs with new head coaches. How do you even implement your ideals, your fundamentals to a new football program? So I think Miami just relying on it, Offense, which you beautifully said, that's going to be very simple. I think it's it's not going to affect us as much, but I am interested in strength and conditioning. That is going to be what I'm most worried about because it is a no huddle offense, very fast pace. Oh, what are you talking about? You don't see all those videos with you know Feely in his garage. They're not getting their garage. No, you're absolutely right. I didn't even think about that, but that's a hundred percent. Like Feely has a way. He's a master motivator. He's he's literally, you know going in there and and making great gains the the kids are very are very much responded to him so you know how much can you respond to somebody in a zoom video like come on give me another rep <laughs> you know it's just not going to happen so you're absolutely right uh but you know what when when things start to slowly turn back on and and, and they're allowed to get back on campus you know hopefully these guys man uh, hopefully they, they listen and and they just keep themselves up in the tip the, the best shape that they can within right. within the moment within their garages so that when they get back onto the green tree it pays dividends absolutely roman and you've been breaking down a lot of Rhett lashley film tell us some things that you're getting excited about and i would love to hear some things that may be worrying you going into the season um, let's start with the worry, you know, because then okay. I want to. I'm I'm an optimist by nature, so we'll end up with the other. We'll just get this out of the way. I, I think you know, in terms of I, Miami fans need to temper their expectations in terms of the run game because Red Lashley and the way he uses RPOs, there's going to be a lot of times where he just uses an RPO as a base, you know, call, and it's going to go to the perimeter on like a quick screen, a, a quick tunnel screen, a bubble, whatever, what have you. And and I think when you look at it in tandem, you you get a you get a sense that the running game is going to be effective with the RPO quick pass perimeter game. It's not an overly complicated running dynamic that I saw last year with SMU. Uh, it wasn't something that I was like, wow, on film, like that's a great run, that's a great blocking scheme. None of that really. It was just what you see is kind of what you got. Now, what I am excited about, and if we get a chance to see him, is De'Ara King. Because yes. that's when I think he's going to go ahead and use some of his Auburn style quarterback veer option things that he had because he didn't really use that a lot last year, right? So he didn't really have the capable quarterback to go ahead and carry and keep teams honest. I put that on our YouTube page or my YouTube page and I, and I even showed, I was like, you're, you're seeing teams not really defend the quarterback keep component from the SMU quarterback in this offense with Rhett Lashley. And now I'm going to start segueing into what I really like, especially with De'Ara King. You have to account for him. You can't. You can't. Miami, I'll make this, I'll, I'll say this as boldly as I can. Miami has never seen the running threat capable quarterback that they have in De'Ara King. We've never had this type of dual threat at the Gables. It's not, I don't, you can't even find somebody who runs as dynamic as him. It's not possible. So that's the thing that's exciting because you have this multifaceted aspect. I do have some concerns of who's going to step up, Paul, with the X receiver. Last dominant X receiver I thought we had was Amon Richards. I mean, that was a guy you got to go back to that bowl game. When we played those kids from Morgantown in the Champs Bowl in Orlando, he takes a five-yard stop. He takes it to the house. It blows the game open. If we have a guy like that, because they had Prochet, he kind of like was targeted so many times, but he was a dividend. He was ace. Now you have a running mobile quarterback. You have Harris and Knighton and, you know, a talented freshman stable. You have an X receiver and you have a 12 set when you come in with two tight ends. 
you're going to have fits as a defensive coordinator trying to pick your poison. But to me, you're going to need that extra receiver to step up this year. And who is it? Is it Pope? Is it Wiggins? Is it Jeremiah Payton? Somebody's got to step up there. Uh, but this offense, and to answer the most exciting, it's it's 10 years overdue. Paul, this is 10 years overdue. The, the, like to go spread up tempo in Miami, because that was one thing I've been crying for. I'm like, Miami doesn't use its greatest advantage. It's humidity. I mean, that is the hometown thing that we have. You want to, you know, people are accustomed to now, Paul, that everybody's running up-tempo schemes, but it's different when you're running like 80 plays in the Carrier Dome that finally, by the way, if you know, just got air conditioning. It was oh, the Carrier wow. Dome. <laughs> it was yeah. called the Carrier Dome. That's an air conditioning company. And up until like two years ago, it didn't even have air conditioning. Wow. But you run 80 plays in the Carrier Dome, you're fine. You run 80 plays to 90 plays down in South Florida in the Gables, you're 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 going to be pulling a lot of FIU Butch Davis moves, right? A lot of fake cramps. So, um, you know, that's where we're at. That's what I'm excited about. No, absolutely. And it's funny. I had Damon Sales on. He covered SMU rivals. He's been he followed SMU throughout the whole season. And he was saying the same thing as you. You know, when you have talent around this Lashley offense, I mean, it's just a recipe for success. But one thing that he aggressively kept stating was offensive line by religion. He kept saying, this offense will be as good as your offensive line is. That is going to carry this offense. Now, we all know our offensive line has given up nine sacks against Florida, Duke. Only Charleston Southern was able to let, allow nine sacks. Do you think Garen Justice and Rhett Lashley, you think it will be an instant success with this offensive line year one, or is it going to take – a couple years to get the right guys in the system. I know we just got Ryan Rodriguez in as a center, four-star recruit out of Christopher Columbus High School. What do you think about this offensive line? 34 less sacks. That's what SMU had last year in comparison to Miami, 34 less sacks. Now, you go back, and I'll, I'll challenge anybody. Other than, the guy, other than if you're following the team religiously, I can't tell you somebody on that team as an offensive lineman. And I will say from watching their film, they were just like getting away, guys. I mean, let me just tell you this right now. I watched. I was looking for pancake blocks. I don't think I found one in like six or seven games. They were just very effective at what they were asked to do with Rhett Lashley. And what is Rhett Lashley asking to do? Not much, because he put an emphasis on getting the ball out on the national average. They're below the national average. My as far as from the time that the quarterback gets the ball to the ball being out, they are less than the national average. Miami was above the national average by one second. That one second. Okay, one and a half seconds when you compare to how quick over the comparison of what Lashley was doing versus Enos, it's going to pay the biggest dividends. I'm like, I know if you turn around and you take Miami's offensive line and you just flip flop them, you just absolutely flip flop them, it would have been the same. Next thing you know, it would have been SMU's offensive line would have had 34 less sacks and Miami would have been tops and leading the nation in sacks given up. There's no doubt about it. The system is going to play huge dividends for that offensive line. Is it a question mark? Absolutely, 100%. But I like the fact that he's not going to stubbornly bang his head against the wall like Enos did with long developing play action passes when you don't have the offensive line to do it, and not many teams have. So yes. I'm happy for these kids. I you know, Paul, it was the same thing that I think when when the defense went away from D'Onofrio and went to an aggressive one-gap system yeah. and let the defensive line pin their ears and let the DBs be aggressive. It was the same thing, and I said it then. I said, I'm so happy for these kids that they finally get a chance to play in a system that's Miami cultural. I'm the same way now for these offensive line. I'm happy for these kids because they don't, they don't have to do much. You really don't. Just, just they're going to get the ball out quick. It's all predicated on simple reads. They're going to do it. And, and I'm excited to see this offensive line movement forward with Rhett Lashley's system. Absolutely. And one thing, it's funny, you perfectly nail the coffin, man. Danny knows it, it literally felt like 10 seconds just to get a play action off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was horrendous. And it didn't matter if Dan Marino was under center or Jaron Williams or even De'Ara King. If you give up that many sacks, your pocket breaks down, your quarterback's not going to succeed. The one thing I like about De'Ara King, man, is his running ability, where if the pocket breaks down, he's literally your second running back on the field. I felt like at times Jaron Williams would just stand in the pocket, and he was timid to run. It was like literally he had five yards wide open right in front of him. He would just never take off. 
What do you think about De'Ara King? I know you spoke very highly of him earlier. What do you love about his game? What maybe concerns you? Uh, what do I love? And you're touching on it. We have touched about his running ability. He's a Ferrari with feet. Uh, he's going to be the ability to, you know, when I break down and I watch the high school kids, I always say, is he zone read capable? Meaning like, I want to see when they do that quarterback zone read, that keep. I want to see if the defensive end pays attention to him because if the defensive end is paying attention to him, running backs are going to like that. But when you had like some less mobile quarterback options in the past, they would carry out that fake. The defensive end didn't care. They'd crash right at the running back, right? And I've seen big plays pop because like, just put Malik Rogier, who kept teams at least honestly zone read capable. Teams would just watch Malik to make sure he wouldn't keep it because he would burn a team here and there with that ability to keep it. And now you take the Eric King, who's a zone read home run threat. Like that's the kid that if he pulls the ball and the defensive end decides to crash on the running back, he could keep it and score. And I've and I've chronicled that on my YouTube page. He will score, he'll keep it, he'll score. And that's what Miami hasn't had where. That's a threat as soon as he pulls the ball back and tucks it in the backfield. Like you said, there's like running back 1A and 1B is your halfback and your quarterback, right? Those two guys, if you have two home run threats, that's that's where they're lining up. And I think that's just going to give the dynamic. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. You know, as far as him being an elite level touch passer, okay. I mean, I'm seeing different, you know, I'm seeing different trajectories on ball. I like his deep ball. Um, you know, is this is this a guy where you're gonna say, oh no, this is like Drew Brees though? This is no, he's not a Drew Brees type. But in terms of this offense, it's not gonna be something where Enos wanted Williams, and there was a lot of times you had to throw guys open, right? You had to throw him, you had to anticipate it, you had to hit him on the brakes. It was very timing predicated. Paul, this offense is like, man, you're gonna see it open. I mean, there was a lot of times I try to put myself and implant myself as a quarterback into that system. I'm like, oh, man, I see where the read is. Oh, I see where this is going. Derek King, was, even with Houston, wasn't throwing guys open as routinely or because he wasn't asked to. And I think that's going to make it easy for him, too. So that's going to offset the fact that, you know, am, am I going to classify him as an NFL elite level accurate passer? No, I, I'm not. So that's the thing that maybe would concern me. But he is an elite level runner. Gotcha. And uh, Roman, I know you break down a lot of high school quarterbacks that we offer. Can What's one quarterback that just caught your eye that we've offered where Miami just needs to land and make a priority? I liked, I, I mean, I'm not uh, shy about it. I really like Nussmeyer. <laughs> I, 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 okay. Yeah, I, I really do. I know some publicity might be going the other way. It's just... You just watch some things, and, and I and I think he hasn't hit. You know, obviously his dad was a quarterback coach. I was still a quarterback coach for the Dallas Cowboys, uh, and and you know he's going to get high level coaching. But it's not that because I I see some still rawness about him, and I see some things that can improve in terms of footwork and everything. But like the things you can't teach, he does really well. Like he just feels it. He just when the pocket breaks down, he knows where the escape lane is. He knows how to just extend plays. He's a playmaker. Not every quarterback can be a playmaker. Quarterbacks can look good. They can have good rhythm. They can have good mechanics. They can have very sound feet. But not every not every person that plays the quarterback position, it's when it breaks down, how good can you be? And Nussmeyer was really, really impressive. And, you know, LSU, and that, that, was, that was proof in its pudding too because when I'm watching this guy, he's making like Burrow-esque plays. I'm like, wow, he just out, you know, he just scrambled in the pocket, hits a corner on the money. He's very effective when he's outside the pocket. So I walked away impressed. So I wasn't even remotely – because I like to look at them first before I see their offers. I like to make my right. own assumption because I don't want to be influenced. I don't want to be like, is this kid a four-star five? Everybody's raving about this kid. And, you know, like Spencer Rattler was a guy. I had no idea what he was ranked, but it was the first time in my, like, little ranking system that I do. I just – it's an arbitrary ranking system. I call it a Roman rank at the end of my State of the U pieces. He was my first five-star guy. Lo and behold, later on, he was rated as a five-star. I'm like, all right, cool. I saw that one. This guy's dynamic. And, you know, Lincoln Riley's track record. So the same thing with Nussmeyer. Couldn't tell you what his rating was, but I'm like, this kid is fun. <laughs> he is just – he is fun to watch. So there's a couple of good names, but my my pick to click would be Nussmeyer. I got a question from Sean. Can Rhett adjust in the game as the defense is adjusting and slowing down the scheme? In-game adjustments is something we don't do on both sides of the football. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think you can, but, I mean, he's he's going to – his overall 
his overall mentality is all gas, no brakes. Um, I think what you're going to see from Lashley, if he needs to, he'll take his foot off the gas. Now, okay. what does that mean? It, it, it no breaks. You know, you stop your car in two ways, right? You either right. you take your foot off the gas, and eventually you're going to slow down, slow enough, or you s- aggressively slam on the brakes. I don't see uh, Lashley ever slamming down on the brakes. Okay. Um, I think if it's, it, you know, you're up seven late and you're trying to slow. Yeah. No, nah, he's not going to do that. He's he'd rather he'd rather win by fourteen points. From what I'm telling, with his play counts. He'd rather win by 14 for and ended up being about four extra plays a quarter when I did my breakdown. So it was about 16 extra plays a game that SMU ran versus Miami. Um, and he's looking to just score, 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 score. I, I don't, I don't in game adjustments, I, it's almost different. Your tempo and your in game adjustments are two totally t- uh, different topics for me. Uh, have I seen really good in game adjustments? Sure, sure. I've seen some, some games. I mean, we uh, we have a common opponent. We're playing Temple. When we played Temple, and he just, I mean, he obliterated Temple with SMU. And <laughs> I liked some of the in-game adjustments that he did there. He embarrassed them. Um, but as far as slowing down the tempo to like run the game out, no, nah, he's just <laughs> he'd rather play. He'd rather win by 21, 28 if he can. No breaks. Absolutely. And Roman, I have a question because. I want to pick your brain on this subject. I know we're utilizing the transfer portal a lot. We're bringing in uh, quarterbacks. Manny Diaz, year one, he brought in Tate Martell. Obviously, it didn't pan out the way he pictured. He brought in De'Ara King. I feel like at times the transfer portal is a Band-Aid for um, depth at positions where you need assistance, kind of like a free agency. What are your thoughts on the transfer portal bringing in a one-year quarterback every year, or would you like to develop a quarterback in your system? Ooh, I mean, you have the cases for both. I mean, because Joe Burrow would like to have an argument here. Um, <laughs> he, 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 you know, he was he's the guy that immediately we just brought him up in the last question. But he's the type of guy that, you know, he, he was an Ohio State kid. And I mean, I guess we got the wrong Ohio State transfer. That's all. <laughs> I, I mean, let's let's just be honest. Maybe we just got the wrong one. I just think the Enos fit for Tate was not a good one as well. You know, everybody got sold on it. You know, just coming from Alabama and what they were doing with Loxley, and they went to a spread up tempo. Then we got Enos, and he uh, it was a it was a bad sale, bad sale. He, he sold it, and he went right back to his Arkansas days. Uh, it just depends. It depends on the kid. If 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 you know, he had fifty touchdowns, total of fifty touchdowns. De'Ara King when he was at Houston. If we get forty plus to fifty, oh, oh my yeah. goodness, it's worth it. I wouldn't call that a band aid. I would call that a lifeline. Uh, yeah. So it, it, you know what? It, it's too. It, there's too many factors there. There's too many variables. And and the fact of the matter is, if De'Ara King hits, it's great. Would you like to develop him in your system? Sure. I would sit there and say that's probably best because you have a system in place. You're grooming the next heir apparent. You're grooming the next heir apparent, and then it just it, it trickles from there. But you know, in this case, Miami didn't really have the heir apparent, so going after De'Ara King, I'm I'm full in favor of. All right. Very good, Roman. Manny Diaz, year one, man. It's He won the offseason. People were calling him the mayor of Miami, killing in the transfer portal. Then all of a sudden, he's not so much mayor of Miami. People want him out. He's gone. But he then again, he wins the offseason year two. He's back on the, on the fan side. Everybody loves him. Are you buying into the offseason hype again? Are you back on the Manny Diaz bandwagon? Yeah, I purchased my off-season season tickets. You know, a few months back. <laughs> uh, you know, I purchased my real season tickets after after almost over a decade of being a season ticket holder. Okay. I was like, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> and then next, you know, I, he I, he said before it even came out, they're like, "Who's your pick to be offensive coordinator?" I'm like, Rhett Lashley. And they're like, "Not Kendall, the oh, wow. Kendall." I'm like, "No, no, no, Rhett Lashley's my guy." And yeah, I was on record for that. And uh, I went on WVUM with Mike McCoy, and he asked me then before he's like, "Who's your guy?" I'm like, Rhett Lashley. He's like. Who's Rhett Lashley? No, he knew who Rhett Lashley was, but like people are like, who's Rhett Lashley? I'm like, just trust me, it's Rhett Lashley. And, yeah. you know, that, and then I was like, still not doing it. I'm like, I'm not doing it. And then they end up getting De'Ara King in. And I'm like, all right, I, I can't. I'm sucked back in. So, they, yes, did he did he own enough of the offseason season brand to suck me back in? Absolutely. So did I drink the Kool-Aid orange and green? Absolutely. I still got the orange and green smile. Uh, so, yes, he, he definitely, he's definitely improved what he needed to and that's where i got to give manny credit because manny we've had coaches who were stubborn and i can't sit there and say you know because 
We saw a defensive coordinator stick around probably longer than he should. We saw somebody who was a head coach calling plays as an offensive coordinator, probably not doing it when he should. And Manny was like, there is no debate. Like after this, like this offense with Enos is not going to work. Not with the offensive line that you have. It's not going to work. And he immediately jettisoned the guy and he went and he got a system that I think the fans thought you should run. But apparently the more important thing is he thought he should run. So again, he's made those moves. And I applaud it. That's two years in a row. So hopefully, but eventually, it's just got to meet in between those lines on Saturdays and sometimes Thursdays and sometimes Fridays after Thanksgiving because the ACC hates us. Um, but those are the times when it's going to have to pay because it's eventually he's just going to have to win. And at, hopefully it's this year. I mean, I, you know, we said we 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 said on the Orange Bowl boys are like, you know, he has no excuses. None left. Whoa, this huge pandemic. Yeah, he has another excuse. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got, true. he's got another excuse. So we'll see what happens. Very true. And I think with Manny, I think he's doing, he's trying his best to succeed at Miami. I know his resume, he was going for the Temple job. Uh, what were your thoughts on Manny getting hired at first? I felt like we had a chance to go out and get a coach. In my opinion, I think we felt a little short. We could have gotten a coach with a better resume. How, what's your feeling about the Manny Diaz hire? I always felt Manny was a head coach in waiting. You could just watch the guy. And even like after that first and second year, I'm like, this is going to be a guy. And hopefully, I was like, maybe he could be like the defensive equivalent to a Jimbo Fisher. And that's what I kind of saw happening down okay. the road. Okay. Now, when it just flipped that fast, I saw it happening, but it was a little too soon for my taste, right? I, I was like, yes, I see this. I see why they did it, and I saw this too. You know, if it was another four years down the road and Mark Rick did what he did, and then he decided to go and left it to an heir apparent like Manny Diaz. Unfortunately, we didn't have that four or five-year buffer, so he can kind of grind his teeth and kind of take it over. So it was baptism by fire that first year, and boy, it was fire. Um and in this case, I, I, yeah, I mean, in retrospect, I guess the hot, sexy name beyond that was Mario Cristobal. And when he turns around and wins the Rose Bowl, everybody's going to be like, oh, look, Mario, Mario, Mario. And, and, and again, there too, I'm like, you know, this is a guy that came from FIU. His record wasn't great at FIU. He made FIU somewhat relevant, and that's great. And, you know, he's got T.Y. Hilton to his credit, and that's great too, because I would have took him in Miami in a heartbeat. It, it's just so easy to say it after the fact. But if I you had to hard press me, did Manny get a P5 University of Miami job too soon? Yes. I would say yes, he did. Right place, right time. I thought it was going to happen. Just happened too soon for my taste. I know a lot of people watch my channel, and I think he's gained a lot of stream recently. Lane Kiffin would have been a great hire at Miami. To my viewers personally, I would have loved Joe Brady if we're going to hire today. I think he's a future great offensive mind. Mm -hmm. to be so young coaching in the NFL, what he did at LSU. And he went to Everglades high school, nine, five, four area code right there. That's my cell phone. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still got a day, high, but I'm from Miami, Dade. I, I was like, listen. I, I lived in this place when you didn't have to put your air prefix before you call it. Everything was three Oh five. And then when we had to, I was first the three Oh five. Then they broke up to the nine, five, four. Now I'm in way of five, six, one, and I'm still dialing nine, five, four. Cause I haven't gotten rid of my cell phone. So, <laughs> but here we are. Roman, what, what does Manny Diaz need to address uh, going into year two? Uh, you know, great question. Um, internal, internal. I mean, there's just no doubt about it that every time there's something on a draft, right? They had it today. Somebody posted it today since, you know, in the last five years with the talent that they went in, you know, and they showed the top 10 teams, Miami's 11, right? And you look at all those top 10 teams on that list, in terms of draftable talent or taking their stars and making them and plugging them into the NFL, like like there's Miami has just fell flat so many times. I mean, we've out recruited recruit the coastal. I can't tell you how many times. Even when we're on like sanctions, we still do it. And we and so it's got to be something more like the systems are fixed. You're running an up tempo offense that's going to give you a little bit more play count. You needed to do it. It's long overdue. A decade overdue. You're, you're going to fix those systems, but something something is still not right. And it's it's almost like not tangible. You can't touch it. You, you just got to like feel it and sense it. And it's really about your coaching style versus the type of kids you're bringing in. Do they want it? I mean, you, you can't sit there and say losing to FIU and the demeanor of the team. 
right? The demeanor of the team. Oh, yeah. That's the thing you need to fix. That's the thing. Like, you're losing to FIU, and nobody seems like they care. Like, you're too complicit to dance on the sideline, and it's something that gets the team going, and I get you. But you're down by, like, you know, a couple scores at that point. Like, where's the guy on the sideline that is just refusing and hell-bent on never losing a game? Like, where's that? Like Tim Tebow's speech, you know, I don't like Tim Tebow. I mean, he's playing a little bit better baseball these days, but I don't. But I got to respect the guy. I mean, he lost, and he literally is like in tears. Like, we'll never lose the game again. Like, where's that guy? I, I like we we've right. trained Insta alphas, too many Insta alphas, too many yeah. kids complicit with losing, and and eventually Manny's got to get that right. He's got to get that right. He's got to get these kids that just. Buy in, believe, because at this point, you don't have any more excuses. You're going to have a sexy offense this year. You're going to up the play count. You're going to use your humidity. Your offensive linemen are not going to be asked to block anymore. You've brought in four-star kids. You're at the top of the draft list. Even now, we have more offensive linemen in the last 10 years drafted than Clemson, and Clemson's won a national championship, and that is a true stat. And you got to tell me from on and on and on, and you still can't get it done. Manny, fix it culturally. I don't know what it is. I can't help. You were in the building. You know the kids you're bringing in. Whatever it is, the right mix, you got to get kids who want it, and you got to get kids who believe. And, uh, you know, one thing I want to see from Manny, which he hasn't showed me yet, he brought in a lot of members from his coaching tree. He brought in Coach Banda, Coach Packy. Look at the resumes. Does that resemble a resume that can get you hired at the University of Miami? I don't think so for Coach Packy or for Coach Banda. I think you can bring in Michael Barrell to coach the safeties. He's taking Dre Bly from UNC. He's there. I mean, sorry, Michael Barrell to coach the linebackers, Dre Bly to coach the safeties, both NFL players, have great experience. Dre Bly is at UNC. Mac Brown is developing an amazing staff, and I feel like the resources at Miami, we can develop a strong staff, which is what we've done in the past. When Schnellenberger was here, Jimmy Johnson, Erickson, Butch Davis, look at their staff. It's it's an all-star cast. It really is. And that's what Manny Diaz needs to do. I love the offensive staff. What um what position group are you most worried about going into the season? Ah, oh, well, let's just say last year I had some concerns because when we went to go play University of Florida in terms of cornerbacks, we only had four scholarship cornerbacks available and they were young. And that's not what you're supposed to do. I, I don't necessarily, and I don't want to take unnecessary shots here, but I don't necessarily see how hard is it to get local DBs to come to University of Miami. I, I love it. I, I, I don't I, I don't understand just the difficult, like we shouldn't be having to go in the 11th hour out to a Waffle House in Alabama to get a kid when we have capable kids right down the street. Like. Love. Like, I don't, I, for the life of me, I don't understand that. I mean, like, you see a kid that just got drafted by University of Florida. It was so close, C.J. Henderson. <laughs> like, C.J. Henderson, you're good with, like, what, 10th overall? Like, that was a kid that was committed to you. But, again, we couldn't seal the deal for whatever reason. You know, and he goes elsewhere. And, and it's just, I don't know. So that group, that group, it's another year older, but it's not where it's not where we need to be because I love Trajan. He's heart and soul. He was dogging him. He should have been offered. He he deserved to be University of Miami Hurricane. Not dogging a kid at, at, at all, but he's an undrafted free agent, right? We need to keep the kids home who are going to be like your first and second day picks, right? You know, especially at those positions. At those positions, it's critical. So some some DB concerns. I, I like Aaron Justice. I like what he's doing. Obviously, he pulled Rodriguez, a four-star from Columbus. Yeah. Hello, that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, if the last guy, the guy's last name is Rodriguez, right, from Columbus, he's going to the U. It's not rocket science, you know? And if you have a last name like Bly, who goes to Ely, he should come to the University of Miami. But they just pass, you know? And, I, and, and, and oh, man, it's just it's just frustrating. And I, I don't, I, there's no venom in it. It's just, it's the truth. The proof's in the track record. We're just not getting those numbers the way we are. Uh, as far as a lot of the other position groups, linebacker is going to be a question, but you can see what they did. And we don't have the necessary. We run a 4-2-5 now. That outside linebacker is a striker position. McLeod coming back is huge. And I think we're going to be fast. Even though we're young at linebacker, we're going to be faster at linebacker. Yes. Um, so that's going to be something to watch. So. I, you know, offensively, I think we'll be okay. Uh, nothing really jumping out. We talked about who the wide receiver one is going to be. Who's that X? And if yeah. we can get somebody to step up to be a dominant X that you can't cover, 
You know, it's going to make this offense so much better. But I would have to say defense, man, defense. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think defensive backs, it's kind of scary. Al Blades Jr., DJ Ivy, those are your veteran players returning. To Corey Couch, barely any playing time. He'll be your nickel. Then you have Christian Williams, barely any playing time. You got Isaiah Dunson, Marcus Clark coming in as true freshman. You get in a quarterback like Sam Howe, especially during a day game against Miami where it's not sold out, kind of laid back environment. Miami does not lose at night. Never really does. Only Florida State in 2017, I believe, with a Michael Badgley missed extra point. So last time I can recall it, we might be in trouble if it's a UNC with a gunslinger like Sam Howe. And look how many DBs we have missed in South Florida. Taiwan Mullen, he goes to Indiana. I don't even think he was an offer. Trayvon Mullen, he goes to Clemson. Uh, we got Jason Marshall Jr., Miami Palmetto Senior High School in Dade County. Top three, Miami's not in it. Patrick Sertain, Alabama. Tyson Campbell goes to Georgia. So we're missing on a lot of top recruits. And under the radar, guys are slipping. So it definitely and, is a liability. And that's where you hit it. And that's where you hit it because it's not just the higher echelon because I've seen that trend. I've seen the SEC take and poach some of the top. It's like this, the Prima Noctra thing. If you're a Braveheart fan like me, you know, the English lords, they took their first cuts of the women first, right? That's like what these SEC teams are doing, right? They the Prima Noctra, we get the crop of the crop. But it's just the under the radar kids that we're missing on too, or and there's just too many stories of like just not hitting right, not feeling it, not feeling at home, and it's a certain position. Like we're doing good in other areas, you know, we're we're doing good like that. Like what about our running back class last year? You know what I'm saying? That was good yeah. local talent. That was talent Very. that was sought after. So Very. it's not like it's not like when you sit there and say it's a systemic issue. Yeah, I mean, from from year to year, from class to class, from position group to position group, you, you have hits and misses. We get it. But in this case, it's just like we're hitting in other areas and we're keeping really good local talent home in other areas. We really need to shore up that area of the ball. The, I'll name you three wide receivers right now that Miami did not. They offered, but it wasn't like a priority offer where you can commit right now. Mm -hmm. Anthony Schwartz, Auburn, Elijah Moore, Ole Miss, and Tutu Atwell Jr., Louisville. Three of those guys, Brown and, and two, and my, like my goodness, and that, if you and I love Larry. Larry's been doing it forever. Larry, Larry remembers like he calls me my real name when we talk, and and he remembers me as a player. And I was blessed and fortunate enough to be on one of his like old all two fifty lists. I don't deserve that, by the way. <laughs> and and he, you know, he was screaming like Miami. Whatever you do, you offer two two at well. And I'm like, whatever Blue says is legend and it's lore and just etch it down. It's its own Bible. And I just saw Tutu Atwell take that drag across the middle of the field like a simple mesh. You had every angle in the world and he scored. And I'm like, why is this kid not on Miami's roster? Like that's that's one of those head scratching misses where you're like, I don't know. Sometimes they outthink themselves like the kid's not big enough. The kid's not the kid's not tall enough. And they and they got to stop that because that's go back. What's missing? Well, that's missing. Like a kid that's a local kid that probably wanted to be Miami and score for Miami, but you didn't offer him, and then he goes out elsewhere, and then he hates your guts. You know what I'm saying? It, it's like it, it, like Dante Freeman was like the ultimate, oh, you're too small to get an offer. Like you guys got to be you're like, Randy, hello. Like why would you say that? Because that kid literally took so many players to Florida State with him. Got to be a little bit more diplomatic about it, and you got to be right, man. You can't. Like, man, Louisville was the fastest team I saw last year. It wasn't even yeah. close. They were so much faster than us. Like, their running back, quarterback, and Atwell were faster than any guy on our roster, like, field-wise, like, perspective. I was there. I was sitting. I'm like, these guys, like, it's ridiculous. And, and to see them put up that many points last year and improve from what they did, well, Louisville's going to be a, a scrappy team in that Atlantic division. I'm telling you what. And they're built around Atwell and some speed, so it's going to be exciting to watch for those guys. No, absolutely. And another position people forget about – and we were talking about it at the beginning of the show, but quarterback, when was the last time Miami had someone drafted in the top three rounds? Brad Kai, he got drafted in the sixth round, but that's not your game changer at quarterback. FIU has two players drafted in the past few years. Miami has had none. And look how many South Florida kids came out the quarterback position and did well. Lamar Jackson, Michael White, who's with the New York Jets right now. Then you had the kid from St. Thomas Aquinas. I believe he played at Michigan a couple years as well. Those are just names off the top of my list. We need to Reddick. get the quarterback position back to where it used to be. Yeah, Reddick is the guy that went out over there, oh. you know, and he ended up, you know, picked up by the Dolphins. Whether I don't know if he's still on the roster or not. So, um, but yeah, I mean, even some of the local quarterbacks, I mean, 
Now, this is where it's a catch-22 because there's other areas in the country right now that are killing it. Hello, Georgia. And that 2022 class of Georgia is even going to be special, too. So, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm fine. You just default there. They, they're they just hitting it. You know, they always said, if you want an offensive lineman, go to, like, in Idaho or Indiana, somewhere up there, and you get a quarterback right now, go to Georgia. I don't know what they're doing over there, but they're doing it right. Uh, we seem to be a little bit behind them in terms of the higher echelon of recruiting. Yeah. And But, yeah, I mean, a guy like – I mean, this is what it's going to come down to for University of Miami. You get the rest of the roster, you put your system in place, and then you're going to get a guy like Lamar Jackson. Maybe you don't miss the next one, and that's the guy that wins a national championship for you. You're still going to need that transcending QB, right? Because you you, you can't, you know, because that's how Clemson won their first. And and I'm a, like a big, like, you got to try to do it the way Clemson did it. They did it in stages. It wasn't overnight. They built it in, in time. It wasn't like Miami just, bam, you know, next, you know, we kept the class home and we took the world by storm. They built it in stages. It started with their roster talent. I'm a big blue chip ratio guy. They got over a 50% blue chip. Miami got over a blue, blue chip. They, they got really good coordinators to stay back. We're, we're still yeah. finding our way there. Yeah. Um, and then it just started the springboard, springboard. And when they won, they had Deshaun Watson, you know, <laughs> and that was the guy that took them here. And if you don't have Deshaun, Clemson doesn't win the national championship. And Clemson's not where they need to be. Eventually, you're going to get to the point where you're knocking on the door, knocking on the door, and you need your Joe Burrow. You know, you you need that. So if it's going to come from here locally or if it's going to come somewhere else, I don't know where it's going to come from, Tra or if it's going to come from the portal or if it's going to come homegrown. But you're going to need that guy because it's the most important position in the field. It always has been. And you're right, Paul. I mean, like, you, 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 you know, we're just struggling there, and we haven't had that guy in a while to kind of take us to the next level. So build the platform, and then you're going to need that quarterback to take it to the next level. Absolutely. And then sometimes as fans, I know in Miami – in general, in sports, patience is not a virtue for us at all. We want to win right now because we're used to winning. That was our culture as a Miami Hurricane was going into Happy Valley saying F you and winning by 40. That, that was the norm at Miami. We had a 58 home game winning streak at the Orange Bowl, the cathedral of sports in Miami. Butch Davis, he goes eight and three his first year. Second year goes nine and three. Third year, he goes five and six. Then goes nine and three, then has the greatest college football team of all time. Things don't happen overnight. But Roman, can Manny Diaz survive another disappointing season? Uh, I think so, based on the fact. Remember what we said? He had no more excuses. Right. He has a big one. I mean, all of college football has a big one. Uh, they're not able to play and implement their system. So if things go south, you have a natural, you kind of have a natural buffer here. Uh, if you didn't have it, I would sit there and say, no, if it goes south this year, then you probably need to cut your losses because I've always said that Miami with Manny Diaz, he's not just a two-year head coach. He's been in system. He's been at Miami now. This will be a sixth year, right? Three, four, six, five years, and that point be six years. So he's been here long enough. That defense is all his guys. So you have no excuses not to be hitting on the defensive side of the ball, especially recruits. And if you can't get it done at this point, it's not like a guy that's, oh, you can't fire a guy like in two years. Like you can't, even though they did it with Willie Taggart at Florida State, yeah. you can't necessarily do that, but he's been here, you know? So if he didn't have this coronavirus thing, I would sit there and say this year was put up or shut up. And if right. it went south like it did anywhere remotely south, like last year, yeah, cut your losses, uh, go break bank. And if Mario has another good year, do whatever you got to do to go get Mario or somebody else. I don't know. Um, but in this case, with this, in the fact you are bringing a new offensive system, I could see him maybe eking out another year with a subpar performance. Yeah, I think eight wins and Manny gets another year. I think the administration, they're vouching for Manny, and they're mm -hmm. going to give him as much room unless things really go south um, to keep Manny. You know, and I think they're tired of having just a in and out of coaches, you know, and trying to get the right one. I want to pick your brain. Do you think the Ed Reed hire was just smoke screen just to like satisfy the fans? Or is that a legitimate role, you believe? I think more publicity than, you know, substantial nature in that one. More publicity. I mean, he's not going to be in the building all the time. It's it's a chief of staff position. It's it's just he's right. got knowledge. You don't kick it out of bed. I mean, that that's a guy who is who who is the goat. I mean, he's one, <laughs> you know. He, he's the man. He, he's incredibly smart. I mean, as a football player, he knows what he's doing. Uh, I think he could be a nice mouthpiece. And, I, and, I, and it really comes down to – it depends on how Manny Diaz views it, right? If, if he doesn't, if he just locks himself away and it's his business as usual and he doesn't conf, you know, con, you know, confer with him, 
then you're going to have some issues. But if you say, hey, Ed, let me pick your brain. Uh, what do you think? What do you think? Then I think it's a, it, it, then it's more substantive, right? Right now, it's just a publicity hire. The, the, the hot name was all with Alonzo. I thought he would have been a perfect hire because, right. you know, he has that 20,000 foot view. He knows what they're, see, I like Miami guys. Don't get me wrong, but Alonzo, and he is a Miami guy, but he has a unique perspective because he saw the whole country. He saw everybody's program. He saw everybody's players. That was his job. Um, so that's where I thought he was a lot more invaluable in terms of roster makeup, how it should be done. Uh, but it, I still had some concerns with Alonzo too, cause I didn't want, you know, a lot of these NFL, oh, we're going to run an NFL style offense. I'm tired of NFL style offenses. You know, they haven't been working here in like 20 years. I want to go more revolutionary up tempo spread. Like we're about to go. So I, I had some concerns with Highsmith too, uh, but you know, at this case, you know, it's, it's, I don't think. I can't see maybe recruited two more. Maybe Ed can help in there and maybe finagle. But in terms of, you know, on the field X's and O's, I, I really don't see how much Ed Reed's going to contribute this year. I really don't. And uh, Roman, you know, we talk about, I feel like everybody wants a Miami guy to come back to the pro program. And I get it. If you're if the ship's going down, at least you're going down with your own people. I respect that. I definitely see that perspective, but man, Jimmy Johnson, Butch Davis, those are two guys from Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Erickson's from Washington State. You came with the AD. Uh, was it Tat? Was it Foot? Maybe Foot. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think I don't think necessarily it needs to be a Miami three hundred five guy to understand the culture. I just think it just needs to click. I want to ask you this question, man. Where has this program gone the past fifteen years? W what has led to our downfall of losing to FIU and Louisiana Tech? You know, this one I is not as difficult for me as it should be because we've kind of touched on it. We've hinted at it, and you were talking about Jimmy Johnson's tree, right? Butch Davis's tree. Jimmy Johnson's tree is legendary. <laughs> we haven't had a tree. Like, we just have not had a tree. You, you go back from, you know, these – you can't name in the last 15 years when we've had a good head coach right? in tandem – with a good offensive coordinator and a good defensive coordinator. Like Manny Diaz was a good defensive coordinator. He got us to the top three defense in the country. Mark Rick was a good CAO figure. The offense was a mess. So now what happens? Now we go ahead and we get the defense figured out, and Enos is supposed to, and Enos can't even get a job as a quarterback guru guy. He's a running back coach for the Cincinnati Bearcats. That's how bad you like just completely crap the bed. That's what Enos did. And you go back. D'Onofrio was well documented. That defense was atrocious. Go back to Patrick Nix. Patrick Nix oh, is coaching my. high school. Mark Whipple can't get a job in the NFL. He gets passed around, and last he was he's at Pittsburgh as an all. And they, by the way, Miami was 13th out of 14 schools in terms of rushing, you know, efficiency last year under Enos. Guess who was last? Mark Whipple. Like we we haven't had a good coordinator tandem here in 15 years. <laughs> it's gonna come down to that. I mean, if football is the one sport where it's coaching matters the most. I, I don't. I mean, basketball is behind that. Like basketball, like X's and O's and that. Hockey, I don't even get it. Like I, I don't know what the hell's going on. They just throw some people out there. They skate around. Baseball, you what? You set your rotation. You're on autopilot. That's the easiest job. Me and you, Paul, we could go coach the Marlins right now. You wouldn't even miss a beat. Like right. uh, who's up on every third day? You. You look like trash. Start the other guy. But football, football is where it matters most. Right. And Clemson's doing it. I mean, Chad Morris goes off and gets a job as a head coach somewhere. I mean, he failed at that. And then you've got a bona fide defensive coordinator who's well sought after. Like, Miami doesn't have that. Miami hasn't had an offensive coordinator poach. You had Jed Fish, right? But at the time, who was his defensive coordinator? That's why Miami has been so – stuck is because we can't hit it on all cylinders. We can't I, hit it on all sides. I mean, look who we've had in the past. Rob Shasinski, Greg yep. Shannon, Randy mm -hmm. Shannon. I mean, Butch Davis. We, we've we had Mark Stoops was our wide receivers coach. Ed Ordron was our defensive line coach. Archeo, mm -hmm. I mean, Archeo is a Hall of Fame college football coach. I mean, our, the list can go on. It, our staff is outstanding, and we were doing those things that Alabama, the Clemsons, are doing now, and we were doing it before everyone else. So we were ahead of the game. Roman, you're the AD at Miami. Who do you want as head coach? 
you got to be realistic. You can't say Bill Belichick and Tom Brady as oh, you it's got to be realistic. I know everybody wants Mario. I'm gonna Brad Coons. I had him two nights ago. Former O lineman Mario Cristobal was his coach. He said he has a chip on his shoulder towards the University of Miami. They rejected him twice. Hmm. Oh my goodness! Given the opportunity, who am I as an AD? Who do I want to be the head coach? Well, first of all, because I've already I'm in bed with the guy, so I got to put all eggs and all eggs in that basket with Manny Diaz. So we're gonna have to support Manny. So that's my politically correct answer. But given the opportunity, who would I want? And it's something that's got to be realistic. So you can't you can't sit there and say, and you're right, Mario is the sexy name. I still have some concerns. He had a good year last year. The year before that was was better, you know, than they were experiencing with Willie. Man, that that is a great question. I you know what? Can I pass on this? I'm so sorry. Because the only reason why I want to pass on this is because this is who I want as my offensive coordinator, Rhett Lashley, right? And if Baker is kind of takes another step back this year, we'll talk about defensive coordinators. Because remember, I want this trifecta. Can Manny be the guy? Yes. But I don't want to go ahead and get Mario Cristobal and then get stuck with another Enos at offensive coordinator. I don't want to get a Mario Cristobal and get stuck with um, you know, another Mark D'Onofrio as a defensive coordinator. Right now, I'm just so excited for Rhett Lashley and what the right. capability of what he is going to do. That's what I want. I want that guy who was at SMU putting up over 40 points a game which I don't know if people know this, is not easy to do, okay? <laughs> There's not a lot of teams in the country last year who did it, right? And two of the guys, right, right behind him was Memphis, and he parlayed that 40-plus points a game and took a job at Florida State. That's right. how impressive putting up 40 points a game. doesn't matter what conference you're in. It's all In your conference, it's apples to apples, right? Your, your conference, you're playing your opponent, and he played teams like Oklahoma. He still averaged over 40 points a game. You know, well, he didn't play Oklahoma. That was Houston with De'Ara King. But SMU is still playing some teams and playing some P5 teams, and they're scoring and averaging over 40 points a game. So I'm going to default on the on the head coach position, but on the offensive coordinator, I'll just say that's the guy that I would want. That's the guy who I would have picked last year if you would have asked me this question. Oh, absolutely. And, and kind of take the UNC model. You know, they have Mac Brown. He, he's been a head coach before. He won a national title with Vince Young. Philip Longo's their OC. He was – they're OC at Ole Miss under Hugh Freeze. So you get the head coach as the administrator, you get the good OC, and you get the good defensive coordinator. That's a great model. You know, your head coach doesn't have to be the alpha, the ace. You know, surround yourself with counterparts, what you're weak as, and then you will be successful. Roman, what is your season prediction for the University of Miami 2020 season? Man, you know, we drink the Kool-Aid every year. Uh, it, this was a situation where it was like, you know, last year was like, oh, man, look at the schedule. Easy 10-win schedule. This season almost, I mean, on paper, this looks even easier than it did last year, right? I mean, Temple, I mean, and it got to the point after you're losing to FIU and Louisiana Monroe, you're like sitting there thinking to yourself, oh, my goodness. Like, like now I'm worried about Temple. Well, the offensive coordinator just played this team with SMU and they embarrassed them and took them off. I, I don't. I'm not going to do the 10 win thing. I think if I had to put it on paper tomorrow, I'm I'm going to predict an eight and four season because it's okay. Miami. And until proven otherwise, Miami's just going to lose games it's not supposed to. Like I just people ask me like what what's my expectations for this team? I just want to beat the teams we're supposed to beat. You're supposed to beat Temple. You're supposed to beat FIU. If you beat the teams you were supposed to last year, we, we're in a so much better. Side. And who are the teams you were supposed to beat? A team that just put, like they ran the option for 15 years. And they got a new offense. We lose to Georgia Tech at home. Like how? You lose to FIU. You lose your bowl game. I mean, these are teams. Here. Virginia Tech's a mess. They like jettison half their team, and we're losing to them at home. Like when you shouldn't be losing. And if you just would have won those games, yeah, losing to Florida makes total sense. Losing a night game charged against North Carolina on the road. I'm not even saying that's a bad loss. I mean, you're on the road with a new coach. They're blacked out. I mean, right. just like you play us at home. Ask Notre Dame what happened when you when you play us at home at night. Sometimes you're just going to run up against buzz saws, and I get that. But it, it, if you just win the games you're supposed to, it will take right. care of itself. That's all I'm asking for. Just Miami, just get to the point where you're winning the games you're supposed to win, and we'll be all right. I'm going to say nine and three, but we're going to need some Daryl Langham magic to be on <laughs> some some balls that pop your way. I got you. It's going to come down to a lot of final drives. I mean, that fourth and seventeen stunt we had down in Chapel Hill, that can't happen. I mean, we need to stop the bleeding. It's going to be a lot of close games. But I'm going to say nine and three, and I'm hoping we can win more than nine because we're due as a program to win over nine games. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Roman, 
We got 10 minutes left. I would love to do some rapid fire with you if you're if you're okay with it. Down, let's go. All right. So if you guys have any questions, throw them in the chat. We're going to do some rapid fire. Um, and Roman, I got a question for you, man. I got a question. Some baseball questions right here. Oh, cool. Bottom of the ninth, we got runners on third and first. One out. You're mm -hmm. down by one run. What pitch are you looking for? First and third, uh, something low because a good team at that point in that situation, they're going to try to get you into a double play, right? Yeah. So you're going to look to something low. Uh, they definitely don't want to leave you up high because you're going to go ahead and put a ball and sacrifice. Fly does the job too, and you get the ball tied. So I'm coming up and looking low, and I'm just telling low and fast. If I see a low fastball, I'm driving that thing into a gap. If it goes, it goes. Uh, and if it, if I see it kind of like off speed and spinning, I'm not swinging. So I'm going to really key ho at the low bottom end of the zone. I can guarantee you that pitch is coming low, just knowing the situation at that. And that's exactly what I'm looking for, dude. All right. I was looking for elevated fastball. No, no, they don't want it. See, they don't want it up. They don't want it up. They don't because if you hit it up, right, you're going to hit it right, in the outfield. Right, right. They're going to want it down. They're going to want it. They're going to try to afford like a six four three four six three all day. So I'm looking for something <laughs> down. You can see that's the one where it's a little above belt high, and they're like, oh my goodness, that was like you know right down the middle plate. What was he? I was like, if you ever see a major league hitter like take one right, trust me, he was looking for something else. <laughs> he really was. No Altuve's yeah. with Chapman in the playoffs. With yeah, the I have a little buzzer on my uh, you know my chest. Let me know it was a fastball. Yeah, I'm still salty about that. Minty Kane, who's going to be the top wide receiver next year? Ooh, uh, I like Jeremiah Payton. I I, I do. Uh, I think he he kept buzzing. He kept buzzing. He kept buzzing. I think this is this is this is his time. And, and Wiggins obviously flashed a little bit as well. And 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 Pope. I mean, those amongst those three, but give me Jeremiah Payton. Gotcha. Roman, do we have the best D line in the country? Ooh. We have the two best defensive ends, uh, draft prospects. I mean, that is – I don't think that's with debate. And the last one with uh, Rousseau had him the number two overall pick in the country. So that's Chase, you know, Chase Youngland. Um, yeah. So obviously when you have that and you, you bring in the French Quarter, uh, I think those guys are going to be the two best defensive ends. Uh, along the defensive tackles, if we had somebody like – you know, step up if if we could get Nesta to step up if Ford takes enough level. Yes, I think we can threaten in that area, but we would need to get a couple more bona fide stuns at the defensive tackle positions to let me say that it's the best overall defensive line because there's going to be some talented ones across the country. I completely agree. I am not happy with our D tackle position. I think Nesta Silvera, Jordan Miller, Jonathan Ford, they have a lot to back up with all the talking they do, and mm -hmm. I, I'm getting tired of it. If you had Gerald Willis back, say you put Gerald Willis in the middle line as a disruptor, yes, you have the best defensive line in the country. But I don't think you have that Gerald Willis guy at the at the one or the three. So, thoughts on pay for play, Roman? I think he he he's uh, referring to players getting money from that third source apparel thing. Is what yeah. he's referring to. I, I think it'd be a game changer. I mean, for for the the large market cities like Miami, okay. it's it's going to it, you know you got a lot more businesses down. You got a lot more people, you know. So I I think you could get the contracts out there just be like, hey man, you don't need to know anything. But like you know, the Millers own like a like uh, you know they're huge donors to the University of Miami. You sit on the board. I mean, they have a you know contracting company. You don't need to know anything as a contractor, but hey, Tate Martell, you're you know you're fancy on the microphone. Go ahead, go talk. <laughs> you know something like that. I could pay dividends. I could see Miami kind of getting its chunk out okay. of this being a large market team. Um, so from a large city, so I, I could see that. I, I really can. I really send like, hey, you you probably have a better chance to expand your brand. That way, and that, you know, why did LeBron James go to Los Angeles? I mean, come on, he went to right. Miami and then to Los Angeles. Cleveland was his hometown things, but the other two things were big market, big market teams, so he could sell his brand. Miami's a brand brand maker, man. Two brothers playing in the same stadium—that's an outstanding headline. I mean, we can sell that. Does Talia Tagovailoa make the move with his little brother coming to Miami? Um, I, I I could see that. I mean, as it p picks up more traction, if I hear some things, I'll, I'll definitely break down his game. Uh, but at this point, I could see that happening. I'm not I'm not going to kick that one out of bed. No, it's 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 too sexy of a thing. They're a close family, you know. They they wear their lays and their ukuleles. I see them all the time. You know, that's pretty cool. You know, do their chants. Their Samoan chants is awesome. So I think you know they're a close knit family, and if they want to be together, I I could see that happening. And I don't think he gets the starting job this upcoming season. You have a Paul Bear Bryant's grandson in the mm -hmm. 
roster. I mean, that's political. I mean, he's going to yeah. play. You got Mac Jones, veteran upperclassman quarterback. Then you got the mm-hmm. best quarterback in the nation, Bryce Young, who is a star. I'm, I think this kid's going to be a star in the next yeah. level. Works out Alabama's way every time. But um, I think he ends, eventually will transfer out of Alabama, doesn't get the starting job. Do you think Jalen Phillips starts any games over Quincy Roche? Um, barring injury, I don't think so. Uh, I like Roche a lot. His first step is 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 lightning. You know, I really didn't really put a lot of stock in him too because after Trevion Hill, I was like, oh, okay, another transfer. I'm not even gonna drink the water. And then I was like, okay, okay, I'll watch. I'm like, oh my goodness, this kid is so dynamic. First step, these two are gonna be monsters. And, and Phillips was flashing in the spring. But um, you know, I I think it's I think it's Roche's job to lose. It, you know, will Phillips get in rotation? Absolutely. Is he gonna? I think he's gonna pay pay some factor, play some factor. Sure. Uh, but start now. Last year's defense total defense was thirteenth in the nation. A lot of mm-hmm. people felt this was the worst defense under the Manny Diaz um, just time at Miami. Do you think this will be a top ten defense? Um. Yes. Yes, okay. I think it's going to improve a little bit, and that would put it in the top 10. I think it's going to be a little bit better last year. Like I, I say, it's still got a Manny Diaz feel, but here's the difference. It's, you know, they're Spanish, right? How many dialects of Spanish are there? This is this is a Manny Diaz defense, but it just had a different dialect of Spanish that we were accustomed to. It's not exactly the same way. I think right. another year back into that system, that's when you saw a big jump from Manny Diaz year one to year two. Uh, I think with Blake Baker, you're going to see a big difference from year one to year two. I think the speed at linebacker is going to help us out a lot. I think we're going to be able to cover a lot more options. And I think with the two defensive events that we talked about, we're going to be very, very disruptive. It's all going to come down to secondary. But we we were very slow in the secondary to start off the season. You know, that fourth and 17 we brought up, we got torched all day that game. So if our secondary can come in, come to play early, we'll, we'll have a top 10 defense. One more question. Do you think every underclass – oh, yeah, yeah. Do you think every underclassman needs to stay their senior year? Uh, no. no, 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 no. I mean, case by case basis. Some underclassmen, and I said this the other day on the timeline, some financially, they have to go. You know, they, they're burdened, they, their loss of a loved one, uh, family, they, they have children, and, and, they, and they need a paycheck. So, I mean, you hate to see it when they declare early and they don't get drafted, but they're trying to look out for their family, and I get that. And when you got a kid that, like, li- listen, it's enjoy one more year of 15. Okay, on the defensive side of the ball. One more year. That's it. Because if you're projected to be a top five pick, top three pick, what are you going to improve your draft stock? You know, if that's where you're at, go, go, go have fun. That's what Miami should be. You know, you should you should have that. And then the next year, this is when we're talking about, you know, Phillips being a starter to replace Rousseau's production. Right. That's what we'll talk about. But, um, you know, so no, not all underclassmen should stay. Roman, it was more than an honor to have you on, man. It's a privilege. Honor was mine. Thank you. Appreciate your time, man, and many blessings to you and your family. Please stay safe out there, and good luck tonight with OBB boys. You guys have a ton of potential. Are going to do great things, man. I promise you. I I appreciate it. You too. Thank you very very much, man. Go Canes. Time, Roman. All right, take care. All right, everybody. That was Roman Marciante from the Orange Bowl boys. I got Steve Kim coming on at seven p.m. He will be calling in three minutes, so stay on, guys. and uh, yeah, just wait for Steve Kim to call in. It should be shortly. And I'll be right back. Is he done? All right, I'm back on live, guys. Steve Kim's calling in two minutes. Any questions for right now? Roman is all, yeah, Roman did an outstanding job. Appreciate it, Sean. It was a great show, man. Roman did awesome. Brooks, mate, yes, he did make the most of playing time he got last year. He has a bright future. Guys, and remember, Steve Kim is calling in two minutes. So uh, please stand by. Offense, Dan Enos was awful. I have LeBron or MJ. Uh, I got nothing on that, man. Kareem. Yeah, no, no, no. He definitely, Roman Marciante definitely knows his stuff, guys. And, um, man, there's going to be a lot more guests. I got Steve Kim coming on in two minutes. ESPN boxing writer, Kane's fanatic. Guys, Monday, Brian the Beast London, local Miami radio legend. 
Then Tuesday night, I have Jose Duasso. Okay, he was under under Cedric Irvin's staff at Miami Senior High at Westminster Christian, and he is a part of the My, uh, Miami Immortals, which is a seven on seven football team that um, is in Miami, and I think they're one of the best in the nation. So he's going. That's going to be a recruiting show. We're going to talk about recruits prospects in South Florida. Appreciate it, man. Thank you guys so much. Make sure to subscribe if you do if you are not already. This is just the beginning of our journey, guys, of Paul's Scoop on the U. This channel will only get better. It will only get stronger. And I can't do it without your support, guys. So I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Ian. I greatly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. One minute. Steve Kim will be on. We'll call in top of the hour. Steve, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. I'm ready to go anytime you guys are. Hey, Steve, we are live right now. I got 72 people watching us right now, man. Thank you so much for your time coming on the show, man. It is an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Oh, it's great to talk to you football. I mean, honestly, uh, I hope we have a season this year. I, I know. I, I hope so too. Hey, hey, Steve, introduce yourself to anyone who isn't familiar with you. I know you're with uh, you're a boxing writer, but kind of give your Miami Hurricane story how you became a fan yourself. At that level, it is Miami Hurricane football specifically, and uh, really the fandom began in the '80s. I'm a child of the '80s, and where it really sealed it for me was number one. I, I did notice around. 84 and 85 that they played a very exciting brand of football. There weren't a lot of teams passing the ball or even playing pro-style offense at that time. And their uniforms really stuck out, especially in the orange home uniforms. And they had a certain style. And then where I really began to follow them a lot uh, was the 86 Oklahoma game. And that was the last week of September. And Oklahoma had just trampled on UCLA to begin the year. Now, I'm a uh, guy from L.A., um, I was a guy that followed UCLA sports a lot, like most Asians that live out there. Everyone wants their sons and daughters to go to that great school. Right. And what they did to UCLA, who was like a top three team, they had Gaston Green and, and like a young Ken Norton. Ken Norton. I, I had never seen UCLA get I had never seen UCLA get blown off the field like that, unless they played them or the '83 Nebraska Cornhuskers. And I just said, "Wow, this Oklahoma team is very tough. They look very good, and they looked unbeatable coming off that national title." But it really is that one moment where CBS, if you ever go back and it's on YouTube, the introduction they did for that game with both teams' buses coming into the Orange Bowl, the guys getting off, they're showing the warm-ups, and they had the Phil Collins song um, in the air tonight. It was a great introduction. And then when they showed the coin toss with Jerome Brown, Winston Moss, and I think it was Alonzo Highsmith, I said, wow, this is very provocative. This, this is interesting. This is... This is a lot different than back then football. I certainly don't see this with UCLA or the USC. And, you know, Michael Irvin had a great game. He's killing Ricky Dixon. Benny wraps up the Heisman literally in the fourth game of the year. Great brawl breaks out at the end of the game. Like 150 guys going out there fighting each other. And to me, it was very provocative. It was very entertaining. And from that point on, I kind of started to watch them closer and closer. And when they came off the plane in Army fatigue. <laughs> in, uh, I think it was Tucson, Arizona for the Eastern Festival. Now, we're on Christmas break here. I'm living in Montebello, California. Right. When I saw them, I said, wow, look at these band of renegades. And it just really, to me, I thought about it. It really fit the 80s image, not only of America, but specifically of the city of Miami. Miami okay. Vice was a particular favorite show of mine. And uh, South Florida has always been very fascinating to me. It just almost seemed like its own world in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of that was glamorized by that particular show that I would watch religiously for at least three, four years. I love Jimmy Johnson. Uh, Michael Irvin is probably my first real uh, favorite Miami Hurricane. And even though they lost that game with Penn State, uh, you know, the whole steak fry incident, and I know a lot of guys on that team now. I've gotten to know a lot of people within the program throughout the years. And it's just kind of grown from there. And believe it or not, um, Back, uh, I would say 1990 was my first game. Okay. It was the first time Miami had actually come to the West Coast and think they could play USC in the late 60s. They played San Diego State in the last regular season game of 1990. 
Um, they barely won that game, 30-28. Yeah. They're very fortunate to come out of that game. As, that was a great brawl. Yeah. Oh, my God, it was a great brawl. It was at Jack Murphy Stadium. And we just, look, back then it was a lot easier to be around the program because the, the media guys in the back of it would actually tell you the team hotel that they were staying at every road game. Okay. So for years I'd go to road games and never actually go to the Orange Bowl. And to go into the hotel just by accident before San Diego State, because that was a mid-afternoon game, to see Dennis Erickson, and you see, you see like a uh, uh, young Gino Toretta, Daryl Williams, Lamar Thomas, and some of the coaches. It was kind of surreal, and to actually see them for the first time there. Um, and that's how it kind of developed for years. I Look, I've been to road games, and I have all my ticket stubs in my office. i got to send you a picture one day, okay. back when tickets were actually printed as real tickets. <laughs> and I've been to Ohio State, Oklahoma, Arizona, Arizona State, Boston College, Houston, uh, UCLA for Butch's first game we got blown out at. Uh, where else have I been? I've been to uh, Tallahassee a few times. I went to Tennessee in 2002. Last year's Florida game I went to. Uh, I've been all around the country for a lot of Miami games. And it's really, to me, look, I'm a big Laker fan being yeah. in L.A. But there's only one thing I really care about that could really sway my mood one way or the other in terms of a uh, – reaction is probably Miami football and then to go back just a little bit further right around 1997 and 98 when Al Gore invented the internet things like chat rooms and message boards right. came into play and I discovered after all those years of subscribing to King Sport and in my in somewhere in my office I have probably about 300 old copies of King Sport the newspaper edition that I've okay. kept some Very of them cool. I've got been on the crap down the nut and so I, the first Miami uh, message board that I really came in contact on was Brassy, which ended up becoming Kane's time. That was one of the leading sports boards, and I was canine Kane yeah. for years. And that's how it further developed. My first Miami home game, believe it or not, was December 5th, 1998, which is always famous for the UCLA Hurricane game, yeah. where Edger and James ran wild. And oh, I yeah. actually... Um, Remember that game very well because at the very end, Kate McDowell throws a Hail Mary. Ball goes incomplete. For the, I think it's the only Miami game that I can recall where the fans actually rush the field. So everyone's rushing the field. I got right to the 50. I, I took a great handful of Miami Orange Bowl sod. I threw it in my souvenir cup. And I, I still have it on my desk. All these chairs at my office. Oh, wow. Hey Steve, I I, I completely uh, I get it, man. I was I was in Azusa Pacific University. I went to school there for a year. So when you mentioned Ken Norton, I went to school with his son. If we're talking about the great boxer's uh, grandson, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I went to school with them. And I always I always thought, man, like how how were you not a University of Southern California fan? I mean, you go to their stadium, you see their history. I mean, it, it's it's surreal. And so bringing up those yeah. stories, man, that that's awesome. That you became a fan. Yeah, and you know, you have to understand, USC at that point in the 80s, they were pretty good in the early 80s, and they hit a stretch there. Right. From about the mid-80s, even though Larry Smith had a pretty good run, they went the street, three straight Rose Bowl, they were really never the national title hunt. Uh, back then, I thought Miami had a much more favorable television deal as an independent, and they would play Notre Dame every year, right. which I thought was the single best yeah. rivalry in all of college sports in <laughs> about five or six years. There, there have been books written about it. There was a 30 for 30 written on it. Um, you know, also the Florida State rivalry, I thought was the best in-state rivalry of any college football game. And it, it, it's a very special time. If you go back from like about 83 to about 1994, when I thought the dynasty really kind of ran out, you know, there used to be a statistic out of the top 25 games on ESPN in terms of ratings. I think Miami had like eight games at one time out of the all-time top 25. It's really sure wow. it's a national program. And I can honestly say this, I travel a lot to fight. And I like to dress very casually you know, as you go through TSA. So I have, I have the last year of the Miami uh, sweatsuit that was made by Nike. Okay, Bob Bennett, all, all right. came. Uh, when I was in the store with Brad Kaya and his father nice. after uh, the loss of Florida State his freshman year. So, you know, every time I wear it or any Miami gear if I go through airports, I can honestly tell you just about every time I'm in an airport, we're waiting around, you're walking to your terminal, someone always says something about the U. Or, the, or they'll say, let's go Canes. And I don't think that even the own administration 
of the, the of Miami understand how powerful this brand really is across the board. Absolutely, Steve. And Steve, man, I want to pick your brain regarding that. What were your feelings towards the Manny Diaz hire? Were you excited, nervous, or you, you just really had no idea what to expect? You know, I could uh, uh, here's here's what I thought about the Manny Diaz piece. I still remember that weekend uh, very well. We get blown out by Wisconsin on that Thursday, I believe. Right. And then in our stadium, it was Oklahoma against Alabama in yeah. the semifinals of the playoffs. Now, there were actually rumblings that night on social media from some people that I consider very good sources okay. and a few people that I know. During the second half of that game, that Rick was going to retire, which was stunning. And wow. I was so against Rick to begin with, okay? Yeah. Uh, what I was told was that Blake James, basically, based on the pressure that he got from the higher-ups, told Coach Rick that if you don't make significant staff changes, and one of those being his son, John, that he was going to be relieved of his duties. And I give Mark Rick credit. He did the really honorable thing by saying, I'm just going to resign without a buyout. So in my view, at that point, I'm thinking, we've hit the home run here. Not only can we get a new, fresh coach, we don't owe this guy any money. <laughs> so I'm thinking, this is going to be a national search. Now, I still remember waking up that Sunday, so I'm calling some people that I consider to be very much in the know that have never really given me bad information. And they said, yes, it's true. And then when Blake James said, we're going to do a national search, the first name that I thought made the most sense, and I'm not saying that it was the most unanimously popular choice, I voted Mario Cristobal. Right. Um, and I'll tell you why. I didn't care that he played at Miami. That, that's been strung out. We've been burned by that. But I thought it was important that whoever we hired as our next head coach had to have previous head coaching experience. I, I don't believe this is a job that you could learn on it as your right. first time behind the wheel. We're not Miami of Ohio, okay? This is Miami of Florida. The other thing is, I thought that Mario's experience being around Cristobal had been very invaluable for him. And I know certain people have some harsh feelings about him leaving Al Goldenstaff after about 10 days. In retrospect, can you blame him? I mean, I really can't. Then it looked to me like he had really turned the corner at Oregon and right now, he's putting up a monster recruiting class coming off of a Rose Bowl. Looks like he's got that thing rolling. But Mario was young. He's energetic. He's got a great look to him. He knows the program. And he's a bulldog on the recruiting trail. I've heard that from the very beginning when he was an assistant coach about 18 years ago under Larry Coker. I thought he checked all the boxes. Now, all of a sudden, Blake James says, we're going to do a national search. And then by 11 o'clock that night, we go to Manny Diaz. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, the National Search didn't get past the Hex Center. <laughs> or the Schwartz Center. I, it's the most ridiculous thing. And look, I have nothing against Manny Diaz, except he did a terrible job last year. And personally, if it was up to me, I would have fired him. I think going 6-7 and seven with that schedule, I don't care if it's his first year with a fireable offense. I really do. But I know we don't live in the real world, and I don't think Blake James has that type of gumption. But look... It's, look at the bad history or bad luck we've had. Like, the one Keppel coach we needed to hire was Matt Rule. Yeah. Instead, we got Al Golden and Manny Diaz. There's yeah. something wrong there. No. So, look, Manny has a chance to change my mind, but as of right now, I mean, wouldn't you give him an F based on the job he did last year? Were, didn't you tweet out, you don't think Manny survives this bowl loss? Were, was that you, Steve? Well, I don't know. I, I said, well, this was my opinion, because I'm nobody. Okay, I got to give an opinion. Right. I basically said, if it was up to me, I would I have done the Lane Kiffin. <laughs> I wouldn't have let him on the team playing. <laughs> I would have just called him an Uber and said, you find your way back to Coral Gable. <laughs> um, look, I didn't even want to play in the bowl game, and I got attacked by all the Twitter mobs. Oh, yeah. And then I, these people are literally telling me, Steve, these guys earn the right to play. I'm like, guys, none of these guys wants to play in the game. H have you not seen what's going on the last 40 years? Right. And they certainly don't want to play in whatever bowl game we were on. And look, this year, if you go back, and I was at the opening game uh, in Orlando, had great seats right on the 50-yard line. I like what I saw. We battled a top-10 team. And without a couple of muck punts or a drop pass or a chip shot field goal, we're right in that ball game. We played them very well. 
Okay. Fast forward, a team that we played and beat in Virginia, they played Florida pretty well in a very entertaining Orange Bowl. Very good football game. I'm thinking to myself, those teams are playing in a major bowl game. Our guys literally almost got Manny D fired. There, there's a disconnect there. Right. And I, I'll never forget coming out of that game in Orlando. I'm walking out with my friend. I said to myself, there's actually some hopeful signs. I saw some promise. Okay. And it never got better. Yeah. It never got better. It just got worse. Hey, Steve, what, what needs to be addressed immediately going into year two? Well, look, I had high hopes for Dan Enos, and he was a bigger bust yeah. than Marcus Russell in Oakland. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and this, but this, look, this goes back uh, beyond Dan, Dan Enos. Look, Miami for years was always set on playing a pro-style offense. So we, at one time, when I grew up with Miami, when we went from Gary Stevens, probably the best offensive coordinator we've ever had, to Dennis Erickson, we were cutting edge. We went from pro style, and Erickson ran a version of the spread. Okay, and it's evolved from there. But right around 2006 and seven, with like uh, Rich Rodriguez at West Virginia, the game started to shift from the collegiate level. It became much more spread out, a lot of shotgun, then things like the RPO, um, and the read option became more prevalent. You needed quarterbacks that could actually be a dual threat to a certain degree, unless you were completely dominant up front. Well, once Bryant McKinney and Brett Romberg and Vernon Carey left our program, we have not had very good offensive line across the board. We've had some guys make the pros, but collectively they haven't been good. And I think from a philosophical standpoint, we, uh, like I, I'd like to say, we have been the VCR in the Netflix era. We, we've been behind the times. It's been painful to watch the slow, grinding tempo of our games. Can we be honest about this? We are Miami diehards, so we can play any game, and while the game's going on, we're going to be interested in it, even if Alabama is playing uh, Clemson. But I'll be honest with you. For the last seven, eight years, I'm watching some of our games as it's seven to three in the middle of the second quarter, and we're huddling and we're taking out the whole clock. I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is really a bad, boring brand of football. Yeah. We have to be honest about ourselves. There's a great brand, the U. There's a great right. history and tradition. But from a style of play, if you were a young blue chip skill position player, would you really want to play Miami Hurricane football? the last 10 to 12 years. We have to be honest about this. Right. No, absolutely not. It's like our highlights. So hopefully, yeah. You go right, ahead, so Steve. Hopefully, Rhett Lashley is the guy that's going to save jobs because let's be honest, that's going to be his goal. If he's, a, if he's the guy that we think he is, along with Derek King, then Manny Diaz has half a shot here. But if, if he botches it, like he did, unfortunately, with Dan Enos, uh, Manny Diaz is going to wish you that temple. And Steve, are you on the D.R. King bandwagon? Yeah, I do. I like him. Uh, look, okay. we need a quarterback to play modern day football. Okay? To, to paraphrase John Calipari, Jim Kelly ain't walking through that door. Steve Walsh ain't walking through that door. Neither is Craig Erickson. Look, I have said for a year, I was a relatively late convert, but I like to play football. That's the way it's played. Um, I also like tempo. We've got to ramp up the tempo. It's just not the offensive system. they got to play at a faster pace. Okay, we played a way too slow of a pace. I had an interesting conversation with a young man by the name of Austin Pettifer. Yeah. He's on the message boards. He's now an agent. He was actually a walk-on who played uh, in the Brad Kaya era. Yes. He's a wide receiver. And he's very good, by the way. I saw some tape on him burning some future NFL guys on Green Street practice field. I was very impressed. So he's a guy that I trust. He knew what right. was going on. He knows football at a very high level. And I said to Austin one day, I said, Austin, let me ask you something. Based on the type of heat and humidity that we have for a home field advantage at least six games a year, type of speed that Miami can attract, the type of football we should be playing, do you think we should be going more tempo? And Austin basically said, if we ever did it the right way, we would murder teams. We'd wear them out by the third quarter. So that to me is key. I, I am very excited to see the tempo. And De'Aaron King has been a playmaker since his first days when he played a little wide receiver at Houston. He'll be much more committed. Look, I like Jaron Williams. I thought he had the best arm talent of anyone that we had last year. 
problem is he was not committed to the sport. If you talk to anyone that knows anything, you, you, they'll tell you football is not his first love, and that's a big issue as a quarterback. Okay. So do you think – is this Rhett Lashley offense, is this going to be an overnight success, or is it going to be a – you know, Rome wasn't built overnight. Do you expect us two or three years? You know, if it's two or three years, I don't know, especially with this year's schedule. Right. Which, which is terrible. I mean, honestly, look, here's the thing that's really interesting. If you look at last year's schedule, the, I think Miami set a record by losing two or three games in a single season when they were more than a two-touchdown favorite. Right, right. Okay, now they've always said, who are the experts? Not guys like me. Dodge makers. And look, when I don't care what anyone says. You've got to beat FIU. Yeah. You've got to beat the worst Georgia Tech team in 20 years. Okay, they almost lost to Central Michigan. That's when I started to get alarmed with the Central Michigan game. I think they eked out 19-14 or something. I said to myself, this doesn't look good. And then they lost lows to a Virginia Tech team at home that was basically having a, 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 a basically a mutiny on the bounty. Guys were quitting. They had a new quarterback, Hendon Hooker, and that's a game you have to win. Red Lashley's offense, if you talk to people that really study it like Roman, good friend of mine, They'll tell you that it looks complicated, but it's not. The actual genius is in its simplicity and letting players think and play fast. The problem with the Eno's offense is that it was very, very complicated and muddled. There was a lot of motion and shifting. Yes, uh, and also, schematically, look, he kept thinking that Zion Nelson was Bryant McKinney, and he left that kid on an island, and I thought really destroyed his confidence halfway through the year, and, and our, even our right tackle situation wasn't very good with George Campbell. So, look, do I think Miami has parts? Yes. Look, we are not in the SEC East. <laughs> we are in the ACC Coastal. Okay? And I talk about this, and this is something that D Money of Kane's Insight, another great friend of mine, tells all the time. If you look at the NFL rosters, the total number of players from university, you know Miami's still in the top five or six, right up there with LSU. Now, now we don't have the top-end talent, because you saw what happened last Thursday, but if you have that many future NFL players or guys that are going to at least fill out rosters, you should at least at least come in second place in the ACC Coastal. I, don't, I really don't think I'm asking for too much. Absolutely. And, and Steve, I got a question. It doesn't matter who's under center, whether it's Dan Marino, Jaron Williams. If your offensive line gives up nine sacks a game, your quarterback's not going to be successful. We gave up nine sacks to Florida, nine sacks to Duke. Only Charleston Southern was able to accomplish that against Florida. Is, is this offensive line going to get better, or are we going to see any or the same problems we had this past season? Well, see, Here's what I, I will, maybe I'm putting um, my green and orange goggles on. I think the up tempo system where the ball will be out of the hands of the quarterback much faster will automatically make the offensive line, which is not very good, right. at least hopefully 20% better. Okay. Okay. So, look, look do I think Zion Nelson um, can be better? Yeah, because look, if we were a real program, Okay, and you know what I mean by real. First of all, we wouldn't have had to poach him from Appalachian State late into the process. Right. We had completely botched that whole class, right. right? Second of all, Zion put on this ridiculous amount of weight. I couldn't really handle it. And I guarantee you that in most situations, he would not have been thrown out there till his third year in the program after a redshirt year. What we did to Zion Nelson was not fair. Right. The Absolutely. heat that kid took was not on him. Absolutely. Um, they, they are going to need some other kids that look the part, like a Bo Scase. He needs to be better. Um, you know, Navon Dalton never got... He got bigger. He never got better, unfortunately. Right. Corey, Corey Gaynor's going to have to uh, make that next step, and Hopefully, Campbell can develop. You know, and also, if you talk to some of the insiders, Bart Berry, or Coach Berry, was not highly regarded. There, 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 that was not a surprise when he was let go from the, from the last staff. So hopefully, from a schematic standpoint, look, a good system that understands 
where your weaknesses and, and certainly ours is offensive line. Look, I'll be, one of the problems I had last year with Enos, there are too many plays that, A, we are under center. Again, this isn't 1995. The other part is, I thought too many play action passes on third down where quarterback yes. has the back and back turn and we're doing play action and we're taking seven step drop. I, I that to me did not make sense. Listen, I'm not a coach, um, but I do realize this: that if I see a blockbuster video, I wouldn't invest in it, and, and I'm not a banker. So, you know, hopefully this this uh, modernized offensive approach can help out anybody because one thing a good offensive system can do it can hide it doesn't necessarily make anyone better but it can hide your deficiencies gotcha and steve man it's it's funny you mentioned that enos went two under center i mean the game that enos goes to the pistol formation we break records against louisville we have our best offensive performance of the season i just don't know why he didn't keep it that way from the beginning you know i i will say this i'll backtrack a little bit off what i said coming off the uh, Florida State and Louisville games. Okay, so we win a rivalry game. I don't care if Florida State goes on to well. Beating them makes it a decent year to a certain degree. So now we took three from them. Then we come out, we play Louisville. Jaron Williams really had his best game at the Miami Hurricane. I think he's had five touchdowns. And it seemed to be coming together. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, now we've had a disappointing first two-thirds of the year. But if we win out, and I think we get FIU, yeah. We had Duke, uh, and I'm thinking, okay, if we could just get the eight wins and have won six of our last seven games. We're going with some real momentum. Right. I'm thinking this is great. So I'm at the Wilder Ortiz rematch. That was November 23rd of last Very year. Very cool. And, and I'm not going to lie to you. I thought the game would be a 45-7 drubbing. Oh, boy. Okay? <laughs> next thing you know, I'm watching the, uh, the undercard. Leo Santa Cruz is fighting. He's slogging along. Card's taking forever. And I'm checking the ESPN game cap every 10 minutes. And what I'm literally seeing, the score go from 3 nothing, 10 nothing, 13 nothing. And I said, oh, my God. I, I, I literally said, there's no way we can lose this game. We're going <laughs> to win. And it hit me right around the fourth quarter when I'm watching. It's like seven minutes to go. We're still down by two scores. I, I said to myself, if we lose this game, we may help in another game the rest of the year because our guys will quit. Exactly. And in essence, that's what happened. And my understanding is is that early, it was the poor finish that we had, it cost us a few recruits. And so every game to a certain degree, even the ones that don't matter, they, knew they do matter because they can't shape the perception in terms of the momentum uh, of a program. And it was really sad to see. Look, I don't think there's any doubt that the players, at least on the offensive side of the ball, there was a real personality conflict with, you know, from what I've been told, and a lot of them just did not want to play for them at the end of the year. Okay. And it's just the icing on the cake. We lose the FIU in holy, holy land at the Orange Bowl site against Butch Davis, who wanted this job probably more than once. We just would never want to hire him, which I get. It's just icing on the cake. Steve. <sighs> What position group? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll let you take on that. I don't want to interrupt. Yeah, one thing about Butch, um, you know, there's a part of me that loves Butch, there's a part of me that hates him because you know, I was at his first game. Uh, it was September of 1995. It took a while UCLA. for him to going. It did. Look, he did not inherit a lot of talent. Right. There were some front end guys left behind by Erickson, like Kennard Lang, obviously Ray Lewis and Kenny Holmes, and I think Jamie German, and Yakil Green, Danielle Ferguson. So there were some, but it was very superficial. And I remember watching that game at the Rose Bowl thinking, wow, Erickson really did a terrible job of recruiting the last three, four years, which, by the way, he did, if you really study it. So you, you kind of knew that this was going to be a little bit longer of a rebuild, and 97 happened, he went 5-6. and six. I really don't place any blame on him for that. The 30... One scholarships that were taken away were an absolute killer. And the guy does the best job of rebuilding I've ever seen. Using the gray shirts, track scholarships, the stash players, great eye for talent, great player evaluator. And and he had really built this momentum. So we beat uh, Florida, a really good Florida team, 
in the 2001, or is it, was it, yeah, 2001 Sugar Bowl, I'm thinking, right. we're going to be the best team next year. We just had that look. Yeah. Even though Reggie Wayne, Morgan, and Santana Moss were going to leave, I said, you know what, we built this thing pretty good, as long as we got Torsi. And he leaves five days later. And to this day, I guarantee you, that is that divorce that nobody wins. Nobody's happy. Right. Nobody married up. And here's a question for your fans. I, I actually happen to be one of the few fans. I never liked Cobra. I thought he was that substitute teacher who got lucky with a room full of honor roll students. <laughs> and that, that's what he was meant to be. Okay, so I've always had this argument, uh, this fundamental disagreement with a lot of Miami fans. I actually believe that we would have been better off in the long run and still would have won national champions if, if Donna Shalala gets her way with and we Barry bring Alvarez. Barry Alvarez. Uh, and right. he's already so, now. Barry Alvarez is a good coach. You built up a, a, a decrepit Wisconsin program. People do not realize how bad they were uh, when we faced them in 89 in our season opener. They basically had a big high school stadium that was broken down. They had no prospect. Wisconsin now is a perennial top 20 team. That's one of the best jobs yep. of building a program I have ever seen. Now, Barry Alvarez plays tough, hard-nosed physical football. But, look, he's a flexible guy. I don't think he would have turned us into Wisconsin or Dade County. He probably would have opened it up. The type of athletes you have, uh, that to me would have been a better long-term solution than Larry Coker. And you get your your future athletic director. Yes, a football guy, which is yeah. important. And, and nothing against Blake. He ain't a football guy. Trust me. <laughs> He's, he was the AD at Maine. They're only good at hockey. I don't even think they have a football program. Right. And so I just always, I, I've never been a fan of players selecting the coach. Right. To be honest, when you had a substitute teacher in school, wasn't that the easiest fun day in school where you got nothing done? It was a vacation. To be honest. Right. So, look, and, and, and the, here's another thing that I, I, I argue with our fellow fans. If you go back to that 2001 team, we ran a pretty basic offense under Larry Coker. We didn't do a lot of fancy things. Guess what? Wisconsin kind of ran the same offense. Under center, eye formation, run the ball, set up the run, play action pass. What were we really doing different than Wisconsin except having more first-round draft choices do it on the outside? And Steve, I'll tell you what, man. We hired Greg Schiano. Forget Barry Alvarez. What Greg Schiano did at Rutgers. I mean, that's impressive. To bring that program uh, to number two in the nation? That's another great job. You know what I heard about Shiano, though, from a former player of his? I heard two things about Shiano. Shiano actually took the Rutgers job right before that Florida game uh, right. in New Orleans. Right. I was told by a very good source that Paul D. loved Shiano. Okay. That if Shiano never gets that Rutgers job, it would have been Shiano getting the job before Larry Coker ever got an offer. There you go. So, I, so that, that was interesting. The other thing that I was told by a former defensive back that played in the late 90s, um, <laughs> I don't want to reveal his name because, you know, look, I don't want anyone to burn bridges, Completely but he basically fine. said that, you know, that Shiano was terrible to play for. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, he said he was a very disagreeable. He used a certain term that I don't, I don't want to use right now. Okay, they're kids fine. Listening, so. No worries. But the way he said it had me laughing. And this, this was a, a player uh, that won a national title that played a lot okay. on that particular team. He was like, you, would, you would recognize the name. I can tell you off the air. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, Steve, you know um, – what position group are you most worried about going into the 2020 season? That just makes you at night, like, you just can't sleep at night just thinking we're going to get torched. Well, the offensive line, obviously. But I actually think we have some big bodies uh, that have some physical upside. Yeah. So, I think we can make it work. Know, talk, right. You know, a position we don't have a lot of depth as quarterback. Yeah, that's the, that's, that's that's the position. And look, with as much spread that's being played today, where you better have at least four or five, if not six, serviceable guys that can rotate in and out. I'm not so sure we have more than three. And so freshmen are going to have to play early. Uh, that Williams kid last year, that state special teams, I, I don't think there's any doubt he has to play early on. That, that's been one of the great mysteries of the message boards is why can't Mike Rump recruit? Especially kids that he coached. You know, again, we don't know what teams are being played from a recruiting standpoint, but Mike, Mike's been a good coach. He really has from a technical standpoint. 
your players are well taught, but you still need some athletes. And I, I read a stat, and I think it was on uh, Twitter, out of the last 17, 18 blue chip cornerbacks, specifically from South Florida, I think we're one for 17. And I think the last one we got was Tracy Howard. And wow. I, that was in like 2011 or 12, if I recall yeah. correctly. And he wasn't supposed to go to Miami. He was a last second switch, kind of like right. Dante Williams. Right, and before that, I think was Brandon Harris, and he went to Booker T, which is right. a UM feeder school. And his father coached. So, and the other, and the other thing is, um, this guy's going to play whether we like it or not, and he really struggled. And I was stunned by how slow he was with DJ Ivy. You know, yeah, he looks the part, tall, long, but he has no speed, and he had some really bad lapses last year. So, and look, Trajan Bandy. You know, Miami continues to lead the league in uh, players that occur early and don't get drafted or drafted late. <laughs> he, he's, uh, look, he's, he's a really good top slot corner. What, what I noticed last year, though, if you put him on the real outside starting with the Carolina game, he lacks top end deep speed. And so I, I don't know if he's going to even make a roster. Maybe he might fill a role because he's a very tough physical right. player. But... I would have loved to have had him back another year because he's a quality ACC level guy. Right. So it's going to, look, freshmen are going to play. Now, I tell you what's so exciting about the secondary. I want to see a full year of Bubba Bolden. Oh, yeah. And um, Gervin Hall. Yes. I think that could be a very good safety combination back there. 100%. Hey, Steve, do you think Amari Carter should play linebacker? Let's put it this way he, 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 Carter at safety scares me because I don't think he has the hits. He played um, in the wrong very generation. Player. Yeah, you look, know, I've always wondered why why doesn't he, he, he why doesn't he play that rover position that Manny Striker? Diaz plays? Yeah, I mean because if you look at Amari, he is a very hard hitter. He lays the plastic, he can hit right through guys, but in space he struggled. I still can't think of a time now that I now I'm kinda of going through my mind. Has he ever made a sound of ball during his time at Miami? No, I don't think he really has. He, he's not your traditional center fielder or ball hawk. He'll so force very, fumbles. He'll force fumbles. He's a tough guy playing downhill. He's kind of like a uh, uh, Carter. Yeah, the yeah, Jamal, are, Jamal uh, Carter. Jamal Carter. I yeah. think like Jamal Carter. They were very fast athletes downhill, but uh, from a lateral standpoint, change of direction, having loose hips, that's not really their game. So you're right, and Amari, he's got some physicality to him. But um, I've always, I just don't know from his own standpoint, is he a better center fielder? Can he control one half of the field as well as what, what I expect from Gervin Hall or right. Bubba Bolden? I don't think so. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I've never been excited about this recruit, like for any specific recruit, but I truly think Avante Williams is a game changer. Those are the kind of commits that will help Manny Diaz succeed at Miami. What do you what do you think about him coming in oh. as a true freshman? Number one safety in the you nation. Know, it is. And you, you know, he's got twitch. He's got explosion. That's the type of guy that Alabama regularly gets. Yes. You know, and or, or Clemson. He'll play early. And if you look at his highlight reel, he can probably play on both sides of the ball. And with the way the game is spread out, where literally most teams now are in a form of nickel defense starting from first down, okay? So a lot of teams take out their second linebacker or the third linebacker, and you need a guy that's going to be able to play sideline for sideline, have some ball skills, and also be physical and be able to play through uh, ball carriers. Look, guys like Devontae Williams, you don't register them, right? okay? They're here for three years. For better or worse, that's their plan. And once Miami starts getting guys that can really be drafted, at least on the first or second day of third year player, that's when you know you're back. And he's one of those few recruits that you look at and you say, yeah, that guy could play anywhere in the country. So I would expect Devontae Williams. Uh, look, it's gotten so dire at cornerback that if he can cover anything, he should probably be given a shot out there. Even if he's more of a natural safety, because yeah. like, like you said, we might have a really good safety deal already out there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hey, Steve, man, do you, I, I'm dying to know what you've heard, maybe. I mean, people are really worried. Can Manny Diaz survive another disappointing season? I feel like no. Manny's here to stay. I feel like if he gets no. eight wins, he gets another year, though. 
you know what I was told, which I didn't like? Now, we all heard about this chief of staff position, right, that ended up going to Ed Reed. Is and that smokescreen? Is that a bluff? Well, here's what I was told. Okay, and I, and I talked to someone that's in the know that is a big-name Hurricane guy. Okay. And I, I asked them, I said, why didn't Alonzo Highsmith get the job? And they said, Steve, there, this is the problem with Alonzo. Alonzo would have actually held everyone accountable. He has a background in NFL management. Um, I have to know Alonzo very well. So actually, you know, he, he boxed a little bit and got to know him at yeah. the tail end of his oh, career. Yeah. And Alonzo would have been in that building every day. And this is a guy that once his career ended after boxing, he went as an area scout, regional scout, player personnel director, was in the upper reaches of the National Football League. So he knows how a football program should be run. And my understanding was is that the biggest problem with Alonzo is that he would have told Blake and Manny everything. He would have been <laughs> honest. He would have held them accountable. And look, I have nothing but respect for Ed Reed. But in a job like that, if you're not going to even live in Miami, you know, yeah. it's kind of like Michael Jordan. Doesn't he own the Charlotte Hornets without ever actually like living in Charlotte? That, I mean, he's part that, owner. That, he's that, he's that, my, yeah. He's minority owner of the Marlins, too. It's it's the name. Yeah, and so I just kind of look at this, and I, I, I really was hoping that Alonzo Highsmith uh, would have gotten the job because I think that uh, management and leadership is part of his blood, not that Ed Reed can't be effective in that role, but if you're going to take that role seriously, my, my philosophy is you need to be there every day. So, Steve, do you, do you think Manny's can – can lead us to an ACC title game. Do you still have faith at all going into year two with the offseason changes he has made on the offensive side of the football? Because that is a solid staff. That's a nice-looking staff he has. It is. It is a nice staff, and I think we have upgraded. I give Manny credit. Look, I think I think he made some mistakes. Um, it turned out, and I'm not going to second-guess it because I was a huge fan of his talent. I wanted him back, but Jeff Thomas is just simply unfixable at Miami. <laughs> Hopefully he could turn his life around and, and, and carve out an NFL career. That guy, it's a shame. He should have been a, the next version of San Diego Moss. It just wasn't meant to be. Right. Um, Manny, to me, the strength of Manny Diaz is that Blake is really scheduling for success. Yes. I mean, look at the schedule. We're playing Wagner. Yeah. Well, you know, we you know Wagner is. Yeah, it's Wagner in Staten is one Island. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, Wagner is one of those schools when there's a March Madness actually and you fill out the bracket. <laughs> and I Wagner is one of those schools with like a 15 or 16 next to it and they play Duke. Yeah. And they make the tournament every five years with their conference there and they get blown out by 30 and they're happy about it. <laughs> We're playing them in football. Football. I, Wagner. So, I look at the schedule. Uh, look, Temple, we should beat. Um, name me a tough game. Name me a game you know that we don't have a shot in right now on the schedule. There's not one game. I can tell you about trap games, possibly, but no, every game we should yeah, win. Yeah, all of them. Yeah, based, on, yeah based on last year, all of them are trap games. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, Mich right, Michigan State, that was a game I was thinking about going because it's East Lansing. I've never been there. Yeah, I heard it's a. They, they're, they're in transition. That is a program in transition. They don't have a quarterback. I still think we got better athletes than they do. So I look at this schedule. We have Florida State at home. Uh, Virginia Tech is still in a state of flux. That you know that their coach Brian uh, Puente, who I like, it just doesn't seem to fit there. Okay. Hey, but, but um, Steve, to be fair, playing in Blacksburg, Miami either does really well or really bad. There's no middle. Right. There's no middle. You're right. And so. I look at this, look, Virginia, we go to Charlottesville this year, right? That's traditionally a tough game for us. Right. Okay? Um, so I look at that. Here's the thing about Manny. Manny's got to realize, this is what I hated. This is where I really jumped off the Manny Diaz bandwagon. I almost sprained both ankles doing so. <laughs> when he had the nerve and the unmitigated goal, after all the talking he did, and the hashtag of New Miami, Going up on yachts, okay? And I'm not, it got me excited. I was like, wow, we got some personality here. But when he had the nerve to say, after all that, we're in a rebuild at Miami. Yeah, that was a scapegoat. We never heard that last year. Nope, we heard win now. Win now. 
TNM, the I new Miami. Know. Absolutely. And one thing about recruiting in Miami with Mark Rick, Al Golden, we tend to start off really hot. Top five class. And then two weeks before signing today, oh, yeah, CJ Henderson, Randy Russell, Brian Edwards, they all just flipped on you to Florida. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember there was that running back that went to Maryland that just got drafted. McFarland. McFarland. That guy, I was told by our recruiting guys, um, see, this guy was in the bag and then something happened late at night. Okay, oh, I don't know. Under Armour basically said you must protect this house, and so he stayed a cherubin. He would have been a valuable piece. Um, look, I, I'll give Mark Rick credit for this, though. I, I I believe that his greatest contribution was when he came to Miami with his SEC background. That he let the administration know, guys, we need a practice field. We got to have some better facilities. And look, he donated some of his own money. And here's the thing. Miami will never be Oregon or Alabama in terms of facility. It just won't. It won't be Texas. It won't be some of these SEC schools. But I was given a tour of that uh, when, it was, when the practice facility was being built. I was actually taken kind of around the campus to see what it was right. at that point. This was before the Georgia Tech game of 2017. Uh, Daryl Langham's second miracle, okay? <laughs> and I was impressed. I was like, look. If you need a PlayStation built into your locker room, okay, and feet warmers by your feet and warm towels on a conveyor belt to you, there's not a lot of programs that do that. Miami's not the place for you. Right. What they do have in terms of an advantage is a great tradition, great weather, academics are strong. And I walk around the Miami campus at my age, 
and I've seen the improvements throughout the years. And I say to myself, who wouldn't want to go to this school for at least three years of their lives? Exactly. And now, uh, Steve, man, speaking of, you know, recruits coming in, I feel like when we do get the right recruits, they don't develop. I mean, Shaq Quarterman played every snap all four years, and then he gets drafted in the fourth round. Where is the NFL development? Where, where have we lost that touch? You know, look, in fairness to the staff on Shaq, and I was told this by somebody, uh, okay. that's actually an agent now, not often, and they told me this back early in his junior year. The problem with Shaq is he's not going to test well. And if you saw what happened, look, I like Shaq. He's credit oh, to yeah, the yeah, program, great. very solid Absolutely. young man. However, he struggled in space. Absolutely. He really did. <laughs> He's a very good box-to-box tackle player. And in fact, in the old days of the olden football, or when we were playing Oklahoma or Nebraska running the option, he had 25 tackles and would have won the MVP. Absolutely. The way the game is played now, look, I, I guess you're going to make the Jaguars, fourth round draft choice, to generally make it. He's going to be a two-down linebacker who will be taken out on third down because he struggles out in space. And I saw too many times where he's in the alley, matched up against the ball carrier, beat him to the perimeter. And you can see that I don't think that's really coaching. I really don't. Um, the development part, oh, there's an old theory in boxing. The better the natural talented fighter you have, the better trainer you are. So, you know, when you have Sean Taylor, you're going to look great. When you have LeVon Ponder, you're not going to look as smart. That, that's kind of the way it is. I, I, to me, development is important. It matters. Trust me. But you got to get better natural talent on the campus to begin with. Gotcha. Hey, Steve, the past 15 years at Miami, it doesn't take Paul Feinbaum to tell you it's been a complete joke. It's been a third world program, whatever he wants to call it. <laughs> <laughs> Where has this program gone? How has it gotten so low to the point we're losing to FIU and Louisiana Tech? I, I still believe that the hiring of Larry Coker or Butch Davis leaving, Butch Davis should have been the original Nick Saban. He was so far ahead of the game in terms yeah. of recruiting and having an eye for talent that it was an unbelievable advantage. I was told by a coach on our staff years ago that they're turning away future NFL guys. That, that's how hot of a commodity wow. Miami was to these young kids. Was, in fact, it was Coach Don Solomon told me that. I got to know him a little bit. Yeah, right? oh yeah. That's an unbelievable story. And where I knew Coker was not the right fit was when Tyrone Moss had a really good freshman year and he laid on his uh, butt the whole offseason, came in overweight, falling a roof and publicly saying, this guy's fat and a slob, but this is embarrassing. And Larry Coker turns around and scolds Sollinger oh and not the player. Wow. And I knew right then. And I remember talking to Coach Saul. Coach Saul goes, look, maybe I shouldn't have opened my big mouth, but I'm going to be honest about this stuff. And funny story, I happened to know Quadrain Hill very well. Okay. Uh, Q, Q was a boxer, worked out at Wild Card in L.A. We become very good friends. We still talk. And he just said it was really ridiculous. And I hope I'm not throwing him under the bus, but he said with Tyrone Moss, one of the rules of Coach Solinger was, as a running back, you had to be good in pass pro. You had to be able to play special teams before you could even get on the field as a running back to get real reps. Love you could it. see Tyrone Moss could never play special teams. He was terrible at pass pro. But there he was eating up carries because we had no one else. Yep. Breakdowns in culture. And large and small add up over time. And Steve, remember this too. Urban Meyer was just getting started at Florida. Bobby Bowden, Larry Coulter, Coker are old guys. Urban Meyer loved to go on the trail recruiting. Those guys would sit at home. They wouldn't want to recruit. You know, Urban Meyer is one of the five greatest college coaches of all time. I love it. I know I'm not supposed to say that, love but it. I respect the guy. Absolutely. Okay? I'm, I'm not, and I remember when he, the year before he got to Florida, he went 12-0 with Utah. Yeah. And with Alex Smith, they blew out Pitt in a really bad Fiesta Bowl, one of the worst matchups they ever had. <laughs> but when Utah lost them and he went to Florida, I said, we're in trouble. Because they got a real sheriff, we got Barney Fife. And from that point on, we got killed in recruiting. Yeah. I know this for a fact that Florida started killing us. And then it kind of went the same way in the early years of Jimbo Fisher. I 
really thought, and this is harsh, Ben, you could, I have old posts on, on Painstime.com, and I was kind of famous for it. I used to call Larry Coker the worst coach in America. <laughs> I, really, I really did. And people used to have this mantra, but he's 53 and 9 after like five years. And I said, yeah, and if he was a real coach, he would be 58 and 3. Right. And that's how bad of a job I think. And look, if you win a national title, right, and then you come within a very controversial bad call of winning back-to-back and you win your second title, which I was at both of those games, by the way, when you leave Miami, okay, just on that alone, you should be able to get another Power 5 job within a year or two, right, theoretically, if you win a national title or two. He basically couldn't get a job for three, four years and was given an expansion franchise at UTSA. What does that tell you about what what the coaching fraternity and the university and the athletic director think about Larry Coker? He had no idea what the hell he was doing. None. <laughs> None. I think he's a nice man. Very was, nice guy. Ever, okay. Did you ever watch that, um, the sequel to Bad News Bears when they went to the Astrodome? Yes. Ever, okay. Do you remember when the Bears... They needed that old groundskeeper to play like he was the chaperone and he's waving to all the parents goodbye. Right. And then Kelly Lee drove everyone to the Astrodome as an underage kid. That's Larry Coker. That's Larry Coker and Kelly Lee was Ed Reed in 2001. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I, I, was, I was told by former players who played for Jimmy, but they made their hard nosed individuals. Uh, and they would go to practice back uh, back in that era. It was much more relaxed. And they find out this guy's soft. <laughs> soft. It's not going to work. <laughs> so I would convey that without naming them on message boards, and I'd get killed. And I always thought that the LSU hammering that we received oh, in the man. 2004, 2005, Kyle Wright, first yeah. year. Yep. Yeah, we got beat like 45 7. Les Miles ran it up. I really thought right then Larry Coker should have been fired. His whole and staff was, right? Well, what happened was it's what I call Black Monday. Uh, that particular Monday, about two days, two, three days after the game, our Kehoe, Solinger, Solinger, and I believe Hargraves. Warner, and Hargraves were blown out. Yep. And Larry Coker was basically forced to fire members of his staff and scapegoat people. And you know what? There's a history there. When you scapegoat coaches like that, you only have a limited time left at that school. It generally means you're next. And I go bad for Solomon. That's one of my favorite characters, one of the best coaches we've ever had. I mean, if you ever get Quatrine Hill on your show, uh, he will tell you some of the funniest things that Coach Solomon says. And I thought we lost a real football man there. But then we, look, we then after... Coker, we went to Randy Shannon, and I hope that worked for him. A player, of course, great pedigree, absolutely. You know, first African American coach we had, it didn't work out. Okay, so then you're thinking, ah, oh, gee. Then we got Swift talking Al Golden. I can't lie, I was excited. The guy wore a tie, got Temple to the whole game. Bad fit. Hey, hey, Terrible. Steve, did you know? Do you know who was on Al Golden's staff, and it wasn't just Matt Rule. Jason Day. <laughs> Jason Day was on Al Golden's oh my. staff. Wow. And that guy's a go-getter. Jason Day. That guy's a go-getter. Yeah. I mean, I just... And now you look... Now, you, now, now we had a writ. And I'll, uh, I, I, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I kept saying to myself, Mark Rick in his first seven years was an elite head coach at Georgia. Then a guy Absolutely. by the name of Nicholas Saban came to Bama and he wasn't so elite. And Georgia was a really kind of really good but mediocre to a certain degree underachieving team if you really study the back end of his career in Georgia and it's like a fighter you might have a great name but you could be a shot fighter the Muhammad Ali you saw against the Sonny Liston not the same guy you saw against Larry Holmes and my my understanding of Rick was and I knew some players on that team his offense was very antiquated I mean literally we would have plays where everyone's just running a go route and they'd run them over and over again. (laughs) Yeah. And this is the funny part. I know a guy that actually played pro football, um, had a relationship with one of our players, um, a very prominent one. And he, he got access to the all 22. That's the really 
the only way you could uh, study football and understand what a team's doing. My friend was very high on Mark Rick because he said, hey, this guy coached uh, Matt Stafford, Todd Gurley, this guy has to be good. After about the sixth, seventh game of the first year that we had him, I think that was 2016, and we hit that slump where he didn't score more than 20 points by the month, he said, Steve, I was so wrong on Rick. This guy's terrible. Hey. And I go, in what way? He goes, Steve, you're literally just running all goes. There's no route combination. There's no man beaters, no cover two beaters, no cover three counters. He goes, literally, you guys are running one of the worst offenses I've ever seen at this level. <laughs> it's funny you brought that up, Steve, because my mom was on an airplane and she sat next to someone very high with the Arizona Cardinals. And she was telling him, like, you know, my son and my my husband would do anything to sit next to you. They're really excited about Mark Rick tiring. You know what he tells me, Steve? You know what he tells my mom? He goes, no, Miami messed it up. Their guy was crystal ball. That guy's on the rise. Yeah. See, <laughs> right, sometimes I'm like a broken clock. I'm right twice a, a day. I, I just, I knew it. I just, look, football <laughs> is a young man's game in my view. And Mark Rick, God bless him. He's a great human being. He, he's the type of guy that you'd want as your next door neighbors. If you want Ned Flanders as your next door neighbor. Okay. However, he was on the very back end of his coaching career. The pilot light was flickering. Yes. And then the stuff that I heard about John Rick as the quarterback coach, oh, not flattering. Not, I mean, he literally had our quarterbacks doing tackling drills. Hey, okay. And, hey, go and, ahead, Steve, yeah. and that's it. I mean, like the stuff that I was told, I'm like, and if you go back to Mark Rick's staff, when everyone was let go or he quit, say what you want about that staff. Everybody from Thomas Brown to whoever, they all, um, the guy at Florida State now, uh, who's our wide receiver coach? James Coley? The talk guy. No, not, not James Coley. Um, oh, oh uh, Dugans. Ron Dugans. Ron Dugans. Ron Dugans. They all yeah. found a major job. Yes. Like, all of our coaches, no matter what you thought of them, found a good job. Right? Yeah. He had a good staff. Except John Rick. Except John Rick. He's, he's like coaching high school football players in a warehouse. Right. It's like the worst case of nepotism since Tommy Boy. Hey Steve, do, reference, do, by do, the way. <laughs> do you remember that um, Brad Kaya Jr. season, the second half in particular? Did I, am I going oh. crazy, or were we unstoppable the last four games okay. when the offense completely right. changed? Am I am I going crazy? All right, here? let me. Okay. Uh, full disclosure. Yeah, yeah. I know Brad. Yeah. I know Brad very well. Okay, I'm actually very good friends with his father, Brad Kaya Sr. Okay. So I am a Brad Kaya homer. Yeah. Admittedly, this that year still kind of upsets me. Okay, so we get off to this great start, and then we blow the Florida State game. Okay, uh, people uh. still blame Brad because a point after is blocked. <laughs> and for the part of the Miami fans, I don't like. I get it. Brad is not South Florida, but all the criticisms label uh, leveled at him are completely unfair. I. And it's all right, life goes on. Right. So then we lose to North Carolina in another game our offense bogged uh, down. I was in Tallahassee. Then we lose, right. right. Then we lost another game. So then we go to South Bend. Oh. And I actually traveled to that game with Brad's father we, and a couple uh, of his friends. We lost that game on okay. ourselves. We beat ourselves that game. Well, we were down 20 to nothing. Right, the at the beginning. Quarter and half. Right. Okay, so we go to that game. Um, and we stayed in Chicago, all of us. And in fact, one of the guys that drove with us is uh, the world famous Peter Ariz. Oh I yeah. Went to a student. Oh yeah. I know Petey very well. I love Petey. I don't love know any. I love Petey. That's one of my guys. Okay, oh, yeah. so we're going back, and it's about an hour fifteen from Chicago to South Bend because South Bend is one of those places you visit and you get out as soon as possible. There's no there, right? There, so. The whole trip is just really depressing. I mean, we, we lost two in a row. We literally went a whole month without scoring 20 points in today's modern football where certain teams put on 20 points in a quarter. So this whole time, if you go back to that year, who we had, Brad Kyle was a quarterback, our running back was Mark Wald, an NFL guy. Oh, our stud. two tight ends were David and Joku and Chris Herndon, two NFL guys. Studs. Our wide receivers were Braxton Berrios and Stacy Coley. Studs. And I think the third guy was Malcolm Lewis, and then Amon Richards, who would have been an NFL guy. Safety. So, then, right, and then one of our linemen was um, the guy that went to the Vikings. 
Is that Danny uh, Isidro? Oh Isidro. yeah, yeah, Danny Isidore. Yeah. But we had, but we had a decent offensive line. The McDermott's were there, and I, I was under the assumption that when Mark Rick was going to come to Miami, that he was going to run a version of the fast break. A no huddle spread that he ran with Charlie Ward at Florida okay. State. Oh, okay. Because he was a coordinator there with Brad Scott. They were kind of like the co-coordinators. Right. And it wasn't always just the mobile quarterbacks. They ran that system where they had Thad Busby, Danny Connell, um, the old guy, Chris Wanky. Yes. So well, that system worked whether you had an athletic black quarterback or a slow white guy, right? So it, as long as you run tempo, you got some guys on the outside. We never ran it. We kept running the I formation. Yeah. And so I'm there at the game, and I'm sitting next to Brad's mother, Angela. <laughs> this is the first great place of the game. I've never actually seen this in football. First down run on our first possession, running play, negative yardage. All right. Second play, running play on the I formation, you lose yardage. So now it's like third and 14. I think, okay, let's go. Let's, let's throw the ball here. We ran the ball again, and we lost. I've never actually seen that before. Okay, and so the triple negative. So at that point, I just blurred out, get this old man out of here, he thinks. And the guy in front of me says, how can you say that about a guy that's won 78% of his game? And he was a younger kid, and I'm not going to get through, and I said, listen, you want Bible study, go ahead, but this offense has no prayer. <laughs> and so we lose the game, we blow it at the end because we couldn't recover a fumble and all that, whatever. I kept telling Brad's father, uh, I think that there's been false advertising here because I thought we were getting a shotgun spread offense with a little bit of tempo because Brad is extremely smart. That's one of the most cerebral guys I've ever seen. I saw some of his high school games where he was beating teams like Sarah High School that literally had five NFL guys on it, like um, yeah. Adoree, uh, Adoree Jackson yeah. uh, that went to USC. Oh, down yeah. the Titans. First so, round pick. So I kept saying, I don't understand why we're not going shotgun spread and just let Brad basically run the offense. Right. So let's fast forward seven days. We play Pitt. Brad threw for like 430 yards, running basically what I thought we were going to run the whole year. The rest of the year, you're right. We ran the table, and then we get to the West game, and this just still chaps my high. We play West Virginia, in the first quarter and a half, we put on the worst display of offense I think I've ever seen because we're running I formation under center. And I'm thinking to myself, what are we doing? So how did that – let's go back to that game. How did that game break open? We went shotgun. We ran RPO to Alon Richards. We took it to the house. And for basically the next two and a half quarters, we played shotgun spread with a little bit of up-tempo, and Brad played much better, and David and Joku really stepped up. And I could not believe it. So Brad gets a bad rap for leaving Miami after his junior year. You want to know a little dirty secret? Yeah. Rick didn't exactly push to keep him, right. which boggles my mind. Rick just said, hey, do what you want. Right. And so I really think that year, Miami went, what, 9-4? and four? Yeah, 9-4. I think and that was a record. With a better coach, we go 12-2. and two. And a lot of those losses were close games. It wasn't – Blacksburg, yeah. Virginia was a blowout. That was it. Blacksburg was a game that we were very, very fatigued. You could see us kind of psychologically bending. We had a lot of young players. Um, I thought we were kind of hitting that freshman wall. But we literally went, I think, five weeks without scoring more than 20 offensive points. Hey, Steve. And that's with Braxton Berrios in the NFL. Amon Richardson would have been a first draft pick. Oh. Stacey Coley got drafted. And David and Joe, Chris Herndon. <laughs> Pretty good amount of talent. And Berrios wasn't really in that game plan that season. He wasn't really a part of it. Well, yeah, well, the, in defense of Rick, and it was really unfair to Braxton, uh, remember that year, that offseason, Lawrence Cates got injured. And Lawrence would have been that big outside receiver. Right. We didn't have a lot of depth. So, so Braxton is meant to be a slot receiver the way he's built, just the way he plays. When we kick him outside, it, 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 it's just not where he's most comfortable or effective. Hey, Steve, I got a, I got a couple more questions, then we'll wrap it up for you. Sure. Is there a certain profile that the Board of Trustees and the University of Miami and our athletic director look for, for in a head coach? I heard Mike <sighs> Gundy 
does not fit that profile, for example. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering if the profile is, will you work for cheap? <laughs> you know, I mean, look, uh, and look, they're kind of in the ballpark now. Um, that's a very good question. Do they look for a certain profile? And, and, and to defend the, uh, the Miami higher-ups, it's not like we've gone cookie cutter and just hired retreads. They right. hired minorities. Um, they tried to go several different directions. In my view, that in this arms race that is college football, if you are not willing to pay a certain amount and you get what you pay for, that is the old saying in life. It's hard to compete. And beyond that, though, it's not just a bad coach. Coordinators are now making seven figures. Yep. And that's where we've had a real issue. Um, yeah. I collect old uh, Miami media guys when they still made them into books. And I look at some of these old staffs that Miami had going back to even Howard Schnellenberger. But starting with Jimmy Johnson, his coaching staff were filled with future NFL head coaches, college head coaches, coordinators that went up to the next level. I oh, mean, yeah. Jimmy's last year in 88, um, his two interns, Tommy Tuberville, who had a really good coaching career. Very good. A guy by the name of Ed Orgeron. The Ed Orgeron. That's the type of talent we were bringing. And then Butch's first staff, you know, had Chudzinski, who I wasn't a great fan of, but he's had a career coaching. Randy Shannon's had a career coaching. Um, and a lot of his other assistants were good. Uh, Chuck Pagano was an NFL head coach. Mario. So, Mario, absolutely. So, if you look at Miami the last, let's say, 10 years, how many young coaches below the head coach have we said, man, that guy's going to be a hot commodity? How many guys? I can't think of one. Maybe. Right. I can't. I mean, Jed Fish was all right. He was solid. He had a. I love Jed. Yeah. You know what? Jed should have stayed at Miami um, because his concepts in the college level are very creative. I didn't know if he'd do well in the pros. I know he didn't have a great run in Jacksonville. But I remember when Jed Fish got hired about three years ago, when it ended up being Josh Rosen's final year as a collegiate, I said, you guys are really going to enjoy him. All my youth and family friends, this guy's <laughs> creative. Yeah. And look, I thought him and Stephen Morris, if they had oh. one more year together, could have had a great run. A healthy Stephen Morris too, man, because he yeah. was injured all the time. What a cannon. I've never seen anything Best like arm. it. You, you know what? Um, he's, remember that movie Bull Durham? He's kind of like Nuke Malouche. <laughs> you know? Million dollar arm, 10 cent hair. Nice kid, though. Very nice kid. I still remember that game at Georgia Tech, that great comeback. Hey, Steve, man, who who's that? If you're the AD at Miami, okay, you, you got to make the decision who's the next head coach at Miami. And let's be realistic here. Who would you go after? I think Mario is sealed in an envelope. I think Phil Knightham has him in his right pocket. Who would you go after? Wow. So you've already taken away my first, second, and third choice. Um, <laughs> by the way, you know what's impressive about Mario? Like, he's lifting good, man. He looks good on the sideline. Yeah, I'm like, that's the way good. a Miami coach would look. Isn't that it? guy looks like he's in better shape than he was at left tackle back 20 years ago for Dennis Erickson. I'll be Damn honest it. with you. Um... Wow, who is that guy? Huh. That's a great question. Um, Remember. Crystal ball is not, and I know it's funny, let's not get any former Miami Hurricane player. Because right, that, right. that, that formula has not worked. Okay, so and unless it's Mario Crystal Ball. So, so who is that guy? Oh, well, hold on. Hold on. This is the guy that I've liked for a while, and I actually wanted him over Rick, and I think he plays that tempo that I like. Dino Babers. Dino Babers. Wow. Oh, wow. He's in the Good hot look, seat at Syracuse. I get it. Look, I get it. His win loss record is not good. It's not like he's playing with Donovan McNabb. And all I know is, is with a group of scrappy underachievers, they could have been 2 and 0 against Clemson. Back in the years, they played for the national title. And Dino is young-looking. He's energetic. He's got a background. He's on a program. He has ties in Miami. What would he be able to do with Miami resources? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I see your point. I do. I just, I mean, he's in the hot seat at Syracuse. I know it's tough to win in Syracuse. I get that. They were successful with McNabb, Freeney, so they've had success there. They have. I Look, I get it. It's, but it's, sometimes it's hard to win at these places. And Syracuse, it, and I've always gotten the sense that Syracuse will always be just a basketball school first. And, yeah, no, I get that. Know, I get it. Dino Babers, look, in that magical run of 2017 when we were, what, number two in the country, there was one possession game of Syracuse that year. Uh, and I remember them wearing out our defense late in that game. If you remember. They had that really uh, athletic quarterback that was giving us fits. Oh, Eric Dungey. We ended up, Eric Dungey. Yeah, Dungey. Oh, yeah. Solid play. So, look, he plays a style that I like. I, I would say, if you don't want to get caught up in individual names, that who's the next coach at Miami? Bottom line, you got to play modern-day football. Yeah. I want spread. I want shotgun. I want tempo. That has to be the number one prerequisite. Steve, I'm going to throw out some names in the comments section. we got 72 viewers, and they're loving the show, man. So thank you so much for coming on. No, no problem. Lane Kiffin, who I think, I mean, what he did at FAU was pretty solid. I mean, his track record's a little shaky. Monty Kiffin said they had a beautiful mansion in Knoxville and just went to shit because of Lane Kiffin. Mike Gundy, who I think wanted the job at one point, but didn't happen. Okay. Going to Lane. I used to being from L.A. and having seen Lane up close. Right. I used to be, about seven, eight years ago, diametrically opposed to Lane. Now, Lane can coach. And look, he's, he's a little bit of a whack job. Right. But I think he fits. Uh, to me, you got to understand where you are in Miami. You're never going to be the most popular team. It's not a college city. I think Lane gets it. Lane can recruit. He will bend every rule to the point of hopefully not cheating. And he's bright. Uh, if Lane Kiffin, they said, Steve, you have to take Lane Kiffin right now. You know what? I say, okay, bring that advisor over. Hey, Steve, I'm going to throw one more name out. And this is because I just, uh, man, my Gus just telling me this guy's going to be a star. I don't know if you've seen the show Entourage before, but I feel yes, like I, I feel like Ari Gold when he first met um, Vincent Chase in that uh, <laughs> Petmo Bismo commercial. His name is Joe Brady, and I think this guy is going to be a star. Oh, I, I yes. just, I think, and he's from look, he's from Broward he County. Saved, right, look, he saved Ed Orgeron's job. I love yeah. him, but Ed was that prototypical cool PE teacher <laughs> who was never meant to be the principal, and now he's a national champion. And go Tigers! So Joe Brady, a very bright guy, the, the schemes that he had, bringing out four or five receivers. You know what's funny? Um, I was actually at Joe Burrow's first game as the LSU starting quarterback when uh, they played Miami and Dallas. Right, I was there too. It was a the funeral. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, once we talk about that, the better. But anyway, um, God. I remember watching Joe Burrow, and I said, this guy's serviceable. Right, He's yeah. He's solid. He's like Ken Dorsey. Okay. Like, you know, he, right, I mean, he might get trapped. It'll probably be a camp bar. Yeah. And to see what he did last year, where I oh. really think that's the best statistical season of any college quarterback in the history of this great sport, that's Joe Brady, man. Because, yeah. look, you could say that LSU had an NFL roster around him from the running back, you know, little Hilaire, um, you know, Jefferson and, and Jordan Chase and all those guys. Look, let's be honest, none of those guys were on our mind before Joe Burrow and Joe Brady got there. <laughs> right? Right. Hey Steve, what, what's your what's your uh, season prediction this year going into 2020? I'll say mine, and then you can say yours. I'm going to say nine and three. We're going to need some Daryl Langham magic, some couple of drives. We're going to have to pull at the end, but I think nine and three and Derek Derek King leads us with his legs. Nine and three with that schedule, which I call hostess because it's Cupcake City. Yeah, which feel like a letdown. It, you know what? So I I talk big and brash and bold. <laughs> I talk like. I had a royal flush at the hand, and I had a pair of twos, it turned out. Um, you know what? I'm going to put a little pressure on old man Well, I am going to say, you say nine and three. I don't know where we get the three, just on talent. I, thought good, I want to say ten and two. And if he goes worse than ten and two, I will volunteer to hang the four sales sign in front of Manny's lawn. That's how strongly I feel. About how much pressure okay. he's putting on maybe he yeah. 10 and 2. <laughs> All right. I love it. I love it, Steve. Hey, Steve, I got a couple boxing questions for you, man. I'm dying sure. to know. Jorge Linares, Ryan Garcia, is that is that in play? Or is 
or is that just it talk? Is in play. Okay. And look, obviously everything has been shut down because of this COVID nineteen. Right. I know for a fact you keep in touch with Lenardo's team and his manager Jose Del Cruz. They want that fight. They oh, made yeah. that clear. I was there. Um, Valentine's night at the Honda Center in Anaheim, they both scored some eye-opening knockouts. Here's the problem. Ryan Garcia is very popular from a social media right, standpoint. Yeah. There's a lot of followers. I guess you could almost call him the Kim Kardashian of boxing, except, look, he has a real career. I think he has some talent. My fear is, in terms of making this fight, is that Garcia and his camp are going to ask for too much money. Oh. And that could really stifle the ability to make the deal. Wow. Lenars, to me, and his team have a much greater understanding of the marketplace. And Paul, right. there's an issue here. Everyone in life, what was normal in terms of the financials, changed now. I'm not so sure the same offers that were on the table prior to March 12th are on the table when we come back in June, July, and August. Wow. You see, I was, I was thinking this is like, because I remember Gar Ryan Garcia's trainer. He said, hey, I'm not going to let Ryan take a fight that I don't think he's ready for. And I don't think Ryan's ready for this fight with a veteran boxer. How many fights has Lenar Linares seen? I mean, Ryan Garcia is very young. Yeah, no, look, what they are thinking, Linares I described as a chandelier. He's bright, he's sparkly, he's beautiful. Just don't drop it. Okay, he's very fragile for all his skills. He is just one of those fighters who is so gifted, but so tragically flawed in that one department. And they're hoping that eventually that Ryan Suncourt that leap the left hook of his and then right. erase everything. Right. But, but on the flip side, he's never faced an offensive threat with the type of pedigree of Lenars. And that's why that fight is so intriguing to me. Yeah. I hope they can salvage it. And here's the problem. If you're not going to have events with crowds, and that's what I've been told by everyone in boxing, and so that revenue stream is cut by at least 25 to 33%, I don't know if Ryan Garcia is going to accept that. So yeah, I'll take a discount. So a lot of these fights that were in play, like I'm talking to Teofimo Lopez. We had him on our show yesterday, me and Mario. Very cool. And Teofimo said, you know, honestly, I want to fight Lomachenko, but if there's no crowd and oh, I take yeah. less money, that becomes a factor. Yeah. Hey, Steve, who's going to be the next star of the lightweight division? I know Gervonta Davis, but he got arrested at a University of Miami basketball game. Did you know that? Yeah, he did. Super Bowl <laughs> weekend, yeah. Oh, I mean, look, God. that is no way. That is no way to treat the house that Shane Larkin built. That was very disrespectful. Oh, man. Very disrespectful. So we got Constantine Topo was rolling over <laughs> in his grave if he's not even dead. Okay, so that was bad. I like Gervonta, but he's a very, very troubled young man. Yeah. He's uh, look, the kid that I bought stock in from the very beginning is Teofino Lopez. Okay. You, are you? He's what if, What do you think about Devin Haney? Very high on him. Very slick. Very well schooled. Nice young man. Um, kind of like in a situation where he's, he's being avoided because the risk versus reward. That quotient doesn't really work out for him, but very talented, very fast. With that quartet of Gravanta, Ryan, Tiafimo, and Devin, I would hope that boxing finds a way to make a consistent set of matches for all those kids against each other in the near future. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, I think that's the future. I really do. And um, Ryan Garcia, are you high on him, or is it all more just show? You know, the question is, is he Millie Vanilli or New Edition? Is he lip thinking? How real is this? Is he built for the long haul? I think that he is. I don't think that it's just a mirage. The kid has abilities that you can't teach. Number one, he's very fast, very reflexive. He yeah. trains to be fast. Uh, I remember asking him a couple of years ago, I said, Ryan, it seems to me like you watched a lot of Roy Jones and Floyd Mayweather videos, and he just sheepishly smiled and said, Yeah, those are my idols. Oh, so wow. he was a Mexican American kid who looked up to two African American fighters and their right. style. Right. And you can't teach speed. The only question that I have is what happens when he gets hit in the mouth? Right. That's and the unknown. Faces you really adversity. Don't know a lot about any of these guys until yeah. they get buzzed. Hey, well, I'll tell you what, Steve. It was a pleasure having you on my show. And I, I felt like I got knocked in the mouth by Mike Tyson, man, after a couple losses this past <laughs> season. Hey, hopefully. The Canes can get it right, man. And it was a privilege and honor to have you on, Mr. Kim.
Thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. We'll do it again soon. Hopefully, the football season talk about uh, all your listeners oh. out there. Stay safe and let's go, Kane. All right, Steve. Hey, many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a great night. You too. All right, everyone. That was Steve Kim. I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, talk about insightful information. Talk about amazing storytelling about the University of Miami program. I just hope you guys all took it in, man. Outstanding show. Thank you, everyone, for joining the show. And always, it's all about the you, baby. Go Canes.